Hey, welcome back to the Metropol Grid. My name is Andre. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we have a new replay review for you. It's been a while since we've done one of these and I'm really excited. These are always a lot of fun. And I first want to give a huge thank you to Chillstat, who submitted two replays, the first of which we'll be going through today. And uh, Chillstat specifically said when he sent these in that he's been largely learning the game of Netrunner in a vacuum. And while he's been reviewing some of his replays, he struggles to kind of uh, address what's been going well for him and what hasn't. What's the sort of stuff he can change? And that's perfect because what we're going to do today is we're going to be going through this is a Jinteki.net casual game that was recorded a couple weeks ago. And we're going to be going through it pretty systematically on a turn by turn on a click by click basis to kind of uh, challenge some of the lines of play and hopefully focus on some strong Netrunner fundamentals that can help just about any player play cleaner and more thoughtful Netrunner in the future. What's important to understand also is that we are playing currently in the standard format. This is standard, so it's a bit of a bigger card pool. And maybe if you're newer to Netrunner, maybe you play startup, maybe you play whatever kitchen tabletop meta you have right now. I just want to emphasize that while we're going to be talking about a certain, uh, just a fair few couple standard only cards, and we'll be highlighting those, most of the information that's going to be within this video should transcend largely whatever format you're playing in. The sort of fundamentals that we're going to be talking about, things like where are the agendas? What's the game going to look like in a couple turns? How are we going to plan our turn on a click by click basis? These are fundamental things that, regardless of what card pool you're playing in, should be helpful. So hopefully there is something here for just about everyone. Cool. Now, quickly before we dive in, there's just a two housekeeping things we want to do. Firstly, we are just using the Jitegi.net replay reviewer. It normally might look a bit different. You have that sort of like time bar across the bottom. I have simply hidden it using the magic of the cyber feeder plugin for Firefox for Jinteki.net. I'm a big fan of it. It gives us some control of how things work. It's the exact same replay reviewer. We're just using the arrow keys instead of the on-screen functions. Secondly, our opponent here, we have just anonymized them. This was just a Jaina casual game, so we've changed their name and their icon. They're just simply the corporation. We have open hands here, so obviously we see the corpse hand and the runner's hands when they were playing. That was not the case. We're mostly going to be focusing on critiquing the runner's play. The corporation plays relatively cleanly. There's a couple things we can shout out for sure, uh, but yeah, mostly we'll be focusing on the runner's side of the table. And then finally, before we dive in, of course, if you appreciate this sort of content, if you got something out of this, if you want to like the video, leave a comment, share with a friend, subscribe to the channel. There's so many things you can do to help the Metropolitan Grid grow. Awesome. I think we're good now just to dive in. And the first place we should start is talking about what decks exactly we are playing. And Chillstead, I'm pretty sure, is playing this deck, which is a Zaya deck that White Blade, the guy you might know from Mutually Assured Destruction, uh, posted this about uh, maybe a month or so ago. And if you haven't played this deck, I actually cannot recommend it enough, specifically if you want to focus on strong Netrunner fundamentals. Because at the end of the day, this is a really fundamentals driven deck. And we're seeing right now in the standard format, even on the highest competitive level, there's a bunch of decks that are just very simple decks in a lot of ways. This deck just contains the minimum amount of breakers, a lot of card draw, some credits, and then enough multi-axis. And as long as we're focusing on our fundamentals and challenging the questions like where are the agendas, we can well translate multi-axis and the minimum other stuff we have around it to a pretty solid and pretty linear uh, game plan. And I like this a heck of a lot. Link for this, of course, will be in the description. So firstly, we're playing Zaya. It's a 40 card minimum. We're not going to spend too much talking about the deck. We're just going to be highlighting some of the more key points. And 40 card minimum is nice. It means we're a bit more consistent on our draw. And Zaya's ability is really nice. It rewards us for doing the thing we want to be doing at just about all parts of the game. She says that once per turn, when a run on R&D or HQ ends, we can gain a credit for every card we've accessed. So as soon as turn one, if they leave an R&D, they leave HQ open, they don't want to raise their ice, we get an access and we get a credit back once we see one card. And that's really good. It allows us to be aggressive in the early game and force the corporation to consider resing ice and kind of spreading themselves a bit thin. And if we get that access, we get a credit back. So we're not often trading those clicks for those accesses for the credits and the sort of other click impression we need to set up. That's fantastic. Now, the rest of the deck actually has a lot of multi-axis in it, a multi-axis that we want to set up across the mid into the late game. And then eventually when we're running R&D or HQ and we're seeing three cards up to sometimes six cards, we will get six credits from Zaya's ability. And that's fantastic. And that actually is a really good explanation of what our game plan here is in this deck. Is in the early game, we're going to be as aggressive as possible. We're going to be face checking into the ice. That's the term of running without breakers and forcing the corporation to res their ice. So we see what it is. They force them to spend their money. And while we're threatening Zaya's ability in the early game, once we get to the mid game, we're going to do those haymakers and make very targeted runs to run the right central server at the right time to access potentially, again, uh, three to six cards on some runs, get a lot of money from Zaya. And that's the idea. Aggro early, then we can slow down in the mid game, and then we can do those haymaker multi-axis runs, and the deck is really well set up to do that. 
I think the next part we can talk about is a multi-access. So we have cards like Wake Implant that charge while we're running HQ, and that translates some multi-access onto R&D in the later point in the game. Pretty straightforward card to play. It's some matchups where they ice up HQ really heavily. It's not the best, but it is definitely a really strong piece. We have a Docklands Pass to sweeten that HQ run, so we get at least two credits over running HQ, let alone all the other nice stuff. And of course, we have two copies of the Twinning for six influence. This will just charge itself through the numerous cards we have in the deck that we can use credits off of. And then this is multi-access that we can generate while just setting up in the mid game if we're kind of locked out. We don't have exactly the breakers to challenge the board state. That's largely the multi-access we're working with. It's all on the table and it's all sort of stuff we can set up in the background. In terms of breakers, this is not too dissimilar to a criminal list. We're just wanting running one of each breaker these breakers are okay. They're not often amazing. They're not the worst. And we're just running one of each, which is not uncommon for criminal lists. That means that we have to be a bit scared of program destruction because it will be a problem. We're also not very consistent in finding the right program when we need it, the right icebreaker. And for that, it's okay because we have two things working for us. Firstly, we have a copy of Mutual Favor. It's only one of in the list, but if we're missing a certain type of breaker, we can hopefully go get it from our deck, put it on the table, which is nice. But more importantly, we have two tricks to deal with ice in a very criminal way. Firstly, we have two copies of Boomerang. This hardware comes down and we can mark a piece of ice and then we can get through that ice, breaking two of the subroutines, regardless of what type of ice it is and what the strength of the ice is. Hopefully the Boomerang will be shuffled back. Similarly to that, we have two copies of Inside Job, which makes a run and we bypass the first ice we encounter, not approach, encounter. And these two cards are really important, the way that they work with the criminal game plan of being as aggressive as we can and forcing the corporation to res their ice. With Zaya's ability, the corporation needs to res their ice in front of their central servers, otherwise we get so much good free Zaya value. If they're resing their ice on their central servers, they have less ice, let alone less money to res the ice on their remote server. Inherently with cards like Inside Job and cards with Boomerang, which are largely criminal staples, Corporations can't feel too secure about pushing an agenda or something important in the remote server in the first couple turns unless they have the ice and can afford to res two ice in front of the remote server. The idea is a single inside job. If you inside job the remote server, they have to res the outermost, you bypass it, and they still have to res the innermost. And this is a really important thing to understand. It's generally the more aggressive you are as a criminal and the more you face check and force the corporation to res their ice, the more they have to slow down, the less secure they are at pushing things in a remote server, which means the more that the agendas actually end up clumping up in HQ and the more that our HQ multi-access also compounds and it gets those agendas and we're winning the game. So all this stuff really works well together. Being aggressive, denying the corporation, forcing them to want to res their ice and then having the threat to challenge their early remote server with cards like Boomerang and Inside Job, it puts the corporation in an awkward spot. And our game plan is be aggressive. Once they iced up, if we're locked out, we build them multi-access and then we go for the haymakers once we're fully set up. We have to keep that in mind. It's a very linear game plan and it's a lot of fun to capitalize on. Now, just about everything else in the deck is just a mixture of card draw and credits. Nothing too flashy that we need to talk about, but the one interesting card that is outside of those categories is Hermes. This is the new console from the Tomina Initiative, and it says when an agenda is scored or stolen, we can return an unresed card from the table back into the corpse hand. And this is, on its own, a very powerful card. It allows us to snowball if we hit R&D, get an agenda, we can rip up the ice on HQ, run HQ, steal an agenda. There's some really high highs for this. But the most important thing about this deck is we're really good at putting a lot of pressure on central servers. But that being said, the corporation, if they're scoring out, their agendas will go into the remote server. But with Hermes down, the idea is that if we can smash R&D, we can unload the twinning, we can unload the wake implant that we've been charging up, we can see five cards on R&D, the chance of us finding an agenda is high. If we steal the agenda, we can just return the agenda the corporation is trying to score in the remote server back into HQ. We buy ourselves a whole turn, the corporation is not scoring out, we can now run HQ to hopefully steal the agenda we think we've returned there. And that is a really cool way that this card allows us to make central pressure into a game plan that also stretches and kind of touches the remote server a fair bit. So a very important card, we're going to see how it matters in the matchup, but also very exciting and very fun to play with. And that's this deck, again, can't recommend it enough, it's pretty straightforward, there's not a lot of bells and whistles, it's very, very, just 40 clean cards, I like it a heck of a lot. Now, there is one card that we're not playing in this deck that is just worth taking a second to address, and that is Diversion of Funds. This is what was largely a quintessential criminal deck. It's rare to see a criminal deck in the standard format for the last, this card's been out since 2017, so about six years, that doesn't have a full play set of Diversion of Funds. Now, we're not playing it, and what this card does, it says it runs HQ, and if it's successful, you can take five credits from the corporation and make it your five credits. It's a very powerful effect, it's uniquely criminal as well. And this, the existence of this card and the ubiquity of this card means that in the standard format, generally the first ice a corporation is gonna put on the table is always gonna be in front of HQ. 
Because if you don't ice HQ into a criminal, on turn one, they can diversion you, and suddenly you just don't have any money. So you can't res any of the other ice you put on other servers, and the game kind of collapses in on itself. So diversion and funds is a real threat. It's still reasonable into the mid to late game to challenge the uh, corporation's money, but our deck specifically isn't playing it, which is a surprise. Uh, I think that's kind of neat. It's not necessary in the deck and diversion of funds hasn't felt as good as it did, you know, even two or three years ago. But the big thing is the corporations are not going to know we're not going to play this and are still going to ice up HQ with some sort of priority because the threat of this card is super important. Just want to say it's notable we're not playing this because this is a pretty common card and corporations will still have to respect it. Now on the corporation side, I was really excited to see what the corp was playing, and it turns out it's something not too dissimilar to a deck that we did a deck dive on a couple weeks ago on the channel, link in the description. We called that Two Casa. In short, this is an Ace Group deck and the HB Identity that plays some of the new upgrades, specifically Two Kana from the recent set that allows you to get uh, ice at instant speed when agendas are scored or stolen. And then we're playing some copies of Ganked to make the runner in, uh, introduce themselves very quickly to that ice, and we can actually cause some pseudo infinite loops. If you want to know more about the deck, again, the description is below. We're not going to dive too deep into it. And also, the corporation here have made some pretty sensible changes to it, uh, moved some influence around, and I like it a lot. But what we're going to keep in mind is only two things really going into here, or maybe three things. Firstly, we need to know the identity here, and Asa Group is a pretty fun HB identity. It's one of my favorites. It's 4515, so standard numbers. And it says the first time a turn that you install a card, you can install a second card in or protecting that same server uh, for no additional clicks. However, the second card cannot be an agenda. It's something kind of similar to Atea, if you're familiar with that from the new set, but it's all about the same server as opposed to two different servers. A really big thing about Asa Group decks, whenever you're sitting against Asa Group, is you know they want to build board state quickly. Very often, click one, turn one, is install something in a remote server and get that clickless ice in front of it. So this deck, as soon as possible, wants to make the game about the remote server because they're really good at putting things in and in front of remote servers, technically any server, but specifically remote servers, as soon as possible. What are those things going to be? Agendas, assets, upgrades. There's usually a lot of upgrades in a lot of Asa Group decks. And so building out and being able to challenge the remote server as soon as possible is a very important thing. We're going to keep that in mind playing against this deck. Now, going into this game, obviously, there's a lot of cards in this deck. You might not be familiar with all of them, and that's OK, because we're going to boil down a lot of our strategy on how we're going to interact with HB with one very basic rule that you should keep in mind whenever you're playing against H Haas Byroid, regardless of what format you're playing into. And that is run early. Face checking is a term we talked about on the runner side of stuff. And that is the idea of running into ice and forcing the corporation to res their ice so they have less money to work with. That's a really important thing. And I can't uh, kind of recommend that enough. I know a lot of newer players who are new to this game might not run until they get their breakers down and they feel safe. But I highly recommend one of the most important things you can do as a runner is force the corporation to spend their money resing their ice. If, say, in the early game we run into an on-cell and the corporation reses the on-cell, sure, the subroutines could be bad for us, but they've also just spent six credits. If the corporation doesn't have money, they can't res their other eyes. They can't play their economy cards. Cards like Hedge Fund require them to have five credits. And this generally hurts them more than it hurts us. Forcing a corporation to spend money is super important, and you cannot wait till you have your breakers down. Now, why I'm saying run early specifically is I think this is a really good example is that there's a lot of HB ice out there that has the Byroid subtype and Byroid ice are generally pretty hard to break. They're pretty expensive to break, but they usually have this text on it that says you can lose clicks while you're encountering it to break the subroutines, regardless of how much money you have, regardless of what sort of breakers you have. And also 1.0 has really strong subroutines. This trash one installed runner card means we risk losing one of our installed breakers of which we only have one of each type. But the idea here is if we want to force the corporation to consider resing one of these, the sooner we do it in the turn, the more clicks we have to be able to click through whichever subroutines we find on the Byroid Ice that are kind of going to be a problem for us. Now, I will say in the standard format, Byroid Ice is not that popular that you have to be clicking through a lot of Byroid Ice. But just this rule extends across so much of the HB card pool that I think Byroid Ice is one of the easiest ways to remember this. If you are going to face check, if you're going to run in general, even if you have your breakers down against HB, do it sooner in the turn than later. Another very popular card in the standard format is Drafter. And you'll notice Drafter is a sentry, but it's not a Byroid. But Drafter's subroutines are really strong, specifically in the mid game. When this fires, you may add a card from Archives to HQ, so you get a bit of recursion as a corporation. But more importantly, you may install one card from Archives or HQ, ignoring all costs. This is so important you're not running into these things last click. 
If you run first click into a drafter and the corporation installs something on the table, the fact that we ran early and we have clicks left in the turn means that we can react to this. And this is just another really good example of why running early in the turn is really important because so much of the ice, whether it's byroids or not, the sooner we run, the less likely it is that we cannot react to the thing that happens to us. So run sooner than later in HB. Now, arguably the biggest example too, and this is going to be one big standard card where we're going to point out is this agenda called ICOA project. It's a 5-3 agenda, and it just simply has defensive text on it. It says as an additional cost for the runner to steal a quote project, they have to spend a click and two credits. This is going to be a really important card in the upcoming matchup, and it's the sort of card that if you're not used to standard, this might be a bit of a surprise to you, but this card is pretty ubiquitous across most HB decks. I expect against most HB decks for them to be playing at least two copies of this card, and for the whole game, if we're not accessing with a click and two credits left in our turn, we are trying to win the game, where the corporation generally has six fewer points in their deck. That's really difficult. So this is an agenda. It's incredibly important that on any access, whether it's a central server or a remote server, that we want to be running sooner in the turn than later. There are just so many reasons because the Byroid Ice, because of some of the subroutines fire, we can react to it. But then specifically cards like Icor Project are a really big deal if we're not accessing with the click and two credits. And I'm going to keep it at that. It doesn't matter if you don't remember the text on Drafter. It doesn't matter if you don't remember the text on Uncell. If we can just keep remembering that when we play against HP, if we're not running early, it's going to be a problem for us for so many reasons. Now, I guess I do have to shout out the one new card from the set MIC, which actively punishes you from running early if you face check into this. I'd argue that's still fine for you. If a corporation spends six credits on turn one or turn two to res a piece of ice, you're generally doing pretty good. And for what it's worth, at the end of the day, still running into this earlier in the turn, especially once you can break this, is going to be very important because of this clause at the top. So again, for so many reasons, when we're playing against HB, we're going to keep in mind that we should be running early in the turn as much as possible. And I believe with that, we can finally dive into the game and see how things go. All right, we're just about to dive in. One thing I forgot to mention is if you want to pause the video here, just take a moment and grab a piece of paper and a pencil. Notepad.exe will also work if you're on a computer, but the big thing here is we are going to be note taking. It's definitely worth noting that note taking is allowed at all levels of organized play, and it is something that most players do not capitalize on. We're going to be spending a lot of brain energy in this entire video worrying about fundamentals, how to play our deck, how to play the matchup, where the agenda is, all these questions we're going to be asking, and that can be really overwhelming. So on top of all that stuff, having to remember every single card that we've accessed from central servers, and we're going to access a lot, it's even an individual turn, we want to be able to offload that. So whenever we see a card in HQ or in R&D, we should jot that down, and then once that card is played, we can scratch it off, and we should have a good idea. There's a lot of turns in this matchup where we know every single card in HQ, but only if we can keep track of everything we've accessed. And please, I promise you, there's enough stuff to be worrying about. You should be note-taking as much as possible. It will help you play better Netrunner. So grab a pencil. And with that, I think we're off. So the corporation goes first on their mulligan, they kept their hand, and we have this hand. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the uh, mulligan plan. The more you play the deck, the more obvious it is. I like a fair bit of this hand. We have a lot of card draw, and we have a bravado, which is a nice way to challenge uh, a server as soon as possible. We talked about how Asa Group is going to be very quick at building a remote server that's going to have something in it that's going to matter. So this is one of the nice ways that we can challenge the remote server while also making money at the same time. So I think on those merits alone, you can keep this hand. The more you play the deck, the more you know whether this is on the higher end or the lower end. I think this is probably an acceptable middle keep, but I don't feel too bad about this at all. Chill is going to keep it and we're off. Corporation is going to spend their turn again. Remember, their first install will be a double install. So they put something in a remote server as soon as possible. I think the corporation rewinds this because they forgot they have a greasing the palm so they can play a card and get two more credits for it. So they're still going to open with that. They're going to get an ice in front of that and then an ice on HQ and pass the turn to us. Now, for this rest of this game, whenever our turn starts, we're going to fundamentally ask ourselves the same three questions. And this is something I do when I play Netrunner, and I think it's a thing that most players should be doing. And specifically answering these questions is going to force you to challenge how we're going to play every single turn. And these are the three questions. First question is, how are we going to win the game and how are we going to lose the game? This is a bit of a daunting question and it gets easier to answer the more you play of Netrunner, so it will come over time. But it's something that we need to answer because we want to make sure that we're pushing ourselves towards winning the game and of course we want to push ourselves away from losing the game. So let's answer that question before we do anything on this turn. How are we going to win the game? We are going to win the game by understanding this deck's macro strategy, which is be aggressive early, get those accesses, get the Zaya credits, force the corporation to spend money, and force them to slow down to respect us. 
Once they slow down to respect us, we can get into a middle game where we get our multi-axis down and we'll do those haymakers on central servers to see four or five cards. And if we see the first top four cards of R&D, how is the corporation going to draw an agenda? We'll win the game there. How do we lose the game? That's also an interesting question. I think we've addressed that before. The corporation now has two ice on their remote server and they're really good at jamming stuff into the remote server over and over again on, on top of what we expect to be defensive upgrades. We're nowhere near ready to contest two ice on a defensive upgrade on a remote server. So the corporation will win this game by taking cards from R&D, putting them into HQ and jamming them into the remote server. And if we're not capable to deal with the remote server, we will lose the game if we cannot disrupt that pipeline of cards from R&D into HQ into the remote server. So we're going to win the game right now by being aggressive, getting a multi-axis. We're going to lose the game if we're not aggressive and the cards can go smoothly from R&D to HQ to the remote server. Now we have to keep this in mind because that's definitely going to control how we play this game. And so right now, our goal is to be as aggressive as possible to slow the corporation down so they can't get that smooth pipeline going. The next question we want to ask is always, where are the agendas? Finding agendas is literally the name of the game when you're playing as a runner. So that is something we need to be challenging ourselves over and over again, because looking at some basic numbers, how many cards the corporation has drawn, looking at how their play pattern is, we can have a good idea of where the agendas might be. On this opening turn, after the corporation didn't mulligan, it's a bit tricky to get a good guess on where the agendas are. On average, there's a rule that about every five cards the corporation draws, one of them is going to be an agenda. So the corporation did draw six cards here. We're assuming there's one agenda in play somewhere. That turns out there's two. But I'm not going to go too hard on this exact question. We have other things that we really want to do this turn. But I promise you it's a very interesting and very important question we'll be coming back to in the next couple of turns when it's uh, there's a bit more information to work with. The final question, and this question doesn't have to be answered every single turn, is what's in the remote server? We only have to answer this when there's something in the remote server, which means there's a chance that there's an agenda on the table. It turns out there is right now. There's a 3-2 agenda behind two pieces of ice. Firstly, the corporation put things behind two pieces of ice. That's a nice way to play around things like inside job or boomerang. We talked about this before. Two ice is safe as much as they have to res both of them. That's pretty expensive. But it looks like the thing in the remote server is something that the corporation really wants to protect. Now, there's a chance that this is an agenda on the table. HP is actually really good at scoring out agendas. Things like seamless launch make it a lot easier that they can score out even four two agendas without showing their agendas. It's kind of unlikely that all comes together, but there's a chance. But this is one of the big card knowledge things that you're going to get to once you get to standard is one of the most popular cards that goes on a remote server as soon as turn one is Rashida Yahim. Rashida is super ubiquitous across the standard format because she's neutral. She costs nothing to res. Only one to trash is not a lot. But when your turn starts, you can res Rashida and get three cards and three credits. Outside of agendas themselves, Rashida is one of the most important cards you can put in a remote server across the whole standard format. And she's often three of in almost every deck because right now, if the corporation has a Rashida on the remote server and she fires, the corporation is going into their second turn with three extra cards in their hand and three extra credits in their hand, which is exactly the sort of forward momentum they need to easily transition to icing up and affording every central server to be iced up and they have enough money to maybe score an agenda quickly and then remote server. So when you look at this board state, I think our options of what's in the remote server is Rashida. That's something we want to deal with. Denying Rashida is really important. It could be an agenda. And then, of course, it could be a defensive upgrade they're setting up. There's also some sort of offensive upgrades, things like Tranquility Home Grid. We won't worry about that so much. But the big thing here that we're really concerned is behind two ice. It's a Rashida or maybe an agenda. And those are both cards we want to challenge. And we want to force the corporation to spend money to have to protect the Rashida. Having an unchallenged Rashida means you just got three cards and three credits. But if we run this remote server and force the corporation to spend money to protect the Rashida, the Rashida is still good, but she's less good. The corp can't has their cake and eat it too. So now answering those three questions, we should have a good idea how we want to play the turn. Remember, our game plan is now with open centrals or at least one open central, we can always run to see a card and gain a credit, make sure we get our Zaya ability. That's a nice spot to be. But also a big part of our game plan is forcing the corporation to res their ice because they only have six credits. It's actually really difficult on six credits for the corporation to afford to res two ice because on average in HB, a lot of the ice costs around three credits. So if they want to keep us out of the remote server, they're paying about three credits to do that. That means then if we swing HQ to see the one card they kept, turns out it's an agenda, they have to probably spend all their money going down to zero credits. That means that this card is not a Rashida. The corporation is in a really ugly spot. But here we have a huge incentive to force the corporation to pay money to protect the thing that they clearly care about in the remote server. And we want to challenge them on that. Now, before we start playing any of our turn, we want to plan our whole turn. This is a very important part of Netrunner is you don't want to spend any click until you have a good idea what the next clicks are. But I think one of the best things we can do right here, right now is consider just challenging the remote server, saying, hey, corporation, I'm going to run the remote server as soon as possible in the turn. If it's a bad face check, we can respond to it. And then after they res something that maybe keeps us out, 
maybe that we have a card in hand that we can draw into, that we can challenge the remote server after the ice is rest. So here, I love bravado in the remote server, figuring out what is in the remote server, figuring out they're gonna protect it. That maybe makes them spend four credits to res an ice, and then we can challenge HQ. If they res that, we can challenge R&D, and then we can maybe set up a bit. And that's what I like to do. I want it to run as soon as I can in the turn. Now, Chill plays this slightly differently. Chill here runs R&D, click one. I think in some ways this is really good because Chill is getting that Zaya ability once per turn. You kind of want to if you can. And so we're gonna see the top card of the deck and we're gonna get a credit after it. So seamless launch. Again, you have your paper, you have your pencil, write this down because we know the corporation is gonna have a seamless launch in their hand. And that means with this in their hand, any 4-2 agenda can be just installed. And on a following turn, the corporation can do advanced, advanced seamless launch. That's a big power of the seamless launch. And we need to know this is in their hand so we understand the capability of what they want to do. So write this one down. We know they're going to draw into that. We got our credit. After that run wraps up, Chill does an aggressive line, which I like, which is the bravado here into HQ. Now, this is part of our game plan. We understand that we need to force the corporation to res their ice. It gives us some information what the ice is, but they need to spend money to get their ice up. And the less money they have, the less other stuff the Netrunner they can do. It just slows them down. So I like this aggressive bravado into HQ. Now, I'd argue you definitely want to do this before you run R&D. We're not actually using that extra credit we got off Zaya, and then we would get potentially the Zaya credit from the HQ axis. But we're going to see a draft of res here. And this is a really good reason why we want to run sooner in the turn than later. Firstly, drafter in the early game, and it's not too bad. You may add a card from Archives HQ, means that the greasing the palm is going to go back to hand. Again, this is where note taking is really important. Write that down. We're now going to note two cards in hand next turn. So that's going to go back to hand. And then the second subroutine says you may install one card from Archives or HQ, ignoring all costs. Now, this is why it's nice to force the corporation to res these cards early, because that second subroutine doesn't do much when Archives doesn't have anything in it. This actually does come back to the sort of sequencing on turn one. Imagine we ran R&D and we saw something that we thought was relevant to be trashed, a Spin Doctor, a Rashida, a Manigarm Skunk Works, and we trashed it. And then we brought onto HQ, this drafter would just reinstall the thing, we just paid credits to trash. So the sequencing here, you generally wanna just send it HQ first to see what the ice is. And then if you know, you're know you not getting in there, then we could consider going R&D for the Zaya credit. We didn't really have a reason to do that first click. And uh, luckily we're not gonna be punished here. But now the corporation, the only card they can install is the one unknown card in hand. And they do, because right now it's a 50-50 to steal the agenda or access the greasing the palm that we know is there. And the corporation goes for it. They install this remote enforcement of 4-2 agenda onto the table. Uh, we'll see if Chill runs it. I would be pretty confused what this is and probably would want to run it. But now we're going to get through. We get our four credits from the bravado. We are putting the corporation down on three credits is really good. And we access the card that we definitely know is there. So now Chill is probably wondering what the heck is this. I'd go check it too. If it's like a Marilyn, a Nico, those are uh, economy cards that are actually definitely worth contesting right now because if you trash them, the corporation doesn't have money and right now money is a problem for the corporation. So we're going to run it. It turns out it's a remote enforcement. Cool. Well, starting with two points on turn one is not bad whatsoever. We have one click left. We're not going to address the corp play too much. I'd argue it's a corporation. You might be better off just keeping the remote enforcement in hand and taking a 50-50 because here, while you trade a click for the runner, you almost definitely lose it. I think they always check what that is in the remote server. Now, last click. The one thing that we haven't challenged yet is what is in this remote server. And on three credits, there's a chance that the corporation can't res their ice to protect it. I think three credits, there's a lot of ice you could expect here. Uh, things like Magnet are pretty common. It turns out there is one here. And we know the corporation double iced this. So whatever they have in their remote server is probably worth protecting. So I don't know if they would res the drafter unless they can also res this remote server. Regardless, it's up to us to run that to force the corporation to res that ice to keep us out, to put them down on zero credits. But Chill here takes an even more aggressive line and he buy bans it. This card costs two credits. Now, it's a very powerful effect. It gives us card draw and a way to install stuff. It gives a lot of click compression. Mind you, if we wanted to run R&D click one, we could have also opened with this if we really wanted to. But the Bio Bands here is very likely to get the run ended because I don't think the corporation would res the drafter on our uh, HQ if they put them to less credits than they needed to protect the thing in the remote server that clearly seems really important. So unfortunately, and in some ways fortunately, the corporation is going to res a magnet. So I think it's fantastic that we ran into this to force the corporation to go down to zero credits. And zero credits means they just can't play Netrunner next turn. Unless this is a Rashida Yahim, which would be pretty good for them, uh, they have to just click for credits next turn. We know every single card in hand and none of those will help them on the upcoming turn. So this is good. We basically bought a whole free turn by being aggressive. I just argue that the buy bans, we lost this unfortunately and paid two credits for that, but it's good that they res it here. Obviously, what's in this remote server is important for them to protect anyways, so I don't think we have to play the Baya to really encourage them to res. It's obviously an agenda. If it was a Rashida, they'd res anyways, so they would have to res these both on this turn. 
Now, there's some really good stuff here. The fact that we were aggressive, the fact that we forced the corporation to res six credits of ice on turn one is phenomenal. Obviously, we also got two points, which is fantastic. We know every card that is in HQ and is going to be coming into HQ, but we could have played it slightly cleaner. We could have kept the buy bands uh, and we could have changed a bit of an ordering there. But overall, a pretty good turn, but it all comes down to that sort of understanding what our game plan was, which is be aggressive and then just maybe structuring the turn slightly different. But overall, not too bad at all. So by bands is going to end the run. We're going to end our turn and it goes over to the corporation. We've been note taking. We know every single card in hand and the corporation did not res this in the remote server. So we know that it is not uh, specifically Rashida, which was the worst case scenario for us. So here they don't really have anything to do besides click for credits. And so they will credit, credit, credit back to us. And this is such a good spot to be in. Firstly, we know all of what's in HQ, so we don't really have to run that. R&D is still wide open, so for, for sure we want to run that to be able to see a card and get a credit with Isaiah. If we end up drawing into something like an inside job or a breaker, we could consider challenging this remote server. The corporation doesn't have a lot of money to res ice, and whatever is in here seems to be important. It kind of looks like an agenda, so I think we have a lot of good stuff to do here. But of course, it's our start of our turn, so we're going to be asking these same three questions. How do we lose? How do we win? We lose by not being able to deal with two ice on a remote server and an upgrade in the next couple turns. And if the corporation can take an agenda from R&D and put it into HQ, that's a bad spot. So we have to be aggressive so they can't afford to do things. And we have to disrupt that pipeline by locking the top of R&D, making sure they can't draw into an agenda because we're seeing a lot of the cards there. We're on a good path to that. Unfortunately, we're not on the good path of breaking this ice. We're not on a good path of getting to HQ. So we're going to have to be drawing into cards to get our breakers down. That is the one thing we're really missing this turn. So how we lose is by not drawing into breakers. They ice up everything and we just fall behind. That's how we lose. We win by doing the opposite of that, getting our breakers down, making sure we're locking the top of R&D and making sure we get our multi-axis down so they just can't draw into an agendas. The second question is, where are all the agendas? We're going to have some interesting heuristics to talk about once the game goes later, but here we have a pretty good idea of where the agendas aren't. We've been note taking. We know every single card in HQ is not an agenda. So the agenda is either in this remote server or every other agenda, of course, is still in R&D. Now, the last question is what's in the remote server. They didn't install anything this turn, but because they didn't res it, we know it's not a Rashida. It could be an agenda or it could be an upgrade waiting. It also could be an economic acid. Regardless, we're not very good at challenging the server. Maybe we'll get some card draw that can change that. But it's important, again, at the beginning of every turn, just to take that 10 seconds to readdress all these ideas. And specifically where the agendas is always the most interesting one for a deck with a lot of multi-access. So now we plan our turn. Going R&D is important. We want with Zaya again to get that credit. And I think opening here with card draw, generally on your turn, you want to do card draw sooner than anything else. Card draw early means we'll have more options in our hand, which means with more options, we can get better, uh, better later turn. The idea is you want to draw all your possibilities before you start committing to possibilities. So by abandoning here, R&D is fantastic. We get our Zaya ability. We'll now know what they're top decking. So we might know every card in their hand. And we also get some card draw and we'll install something probably. So here we draw two first. We draw two daily casts, so just some more economy. And generally, we're going to install a card, reducing its cost by one. Ideally, on this turn, we daily cast is not bad. I think Earthrise Hotel is also a really important card to get down this turn, because as we said on how do we lose, how we lose is by not getting our breakers down or a multi-axis. So in this hand, we do need more card draw, and getting Earthrise Hotel down to get six cards over the next three turns is a really good spot to be in. So we'll install here the daily cast. That's fine. And then we're going to access this Hagen. This is really important. Write this down on your note taking. This is a barrier that subroutines simply end the run because we don't have any programs installed, let alone those subtypes. And it costs four credits for the corporation to res. That's a lot of money. That is a fair bit of money. And you want to write this down because going into next turn, we're going to know every single card in the corporation's hand. This buy bands finishes and chill drops the daily cast and clicks for two credits. I largely like this turn. I think more importantly, though, is if we address at the beginning of the turn, how do we lose? How do we win? We know we lose the game by not drawing into our breakers or a multi-axis soon enough. We have two daily casts ticking, which is giving us four credits a turn. And that's good. Money is generally good, but we have no way of using this money with this hand. I would be much happier if instead of the second daily cast, we put down an Earthrise Hotel because the Earthrise Hotel will be drawing into the cards that we need to put on pressure, let alone some of those cards will be economy cards. But we are currently going to lose the game if we don't draw deep enough into our deck to get, you know, our breakers, get stuff like that. So. I think the money is obviously nice, but we can't actually use the money with the hand we have. So we'd rather do a bit of money and then a bit of card draw and then get the second daily cast down later. So we'll see if we're too slow here. But again, money is not the biggest problem we want to solve right now. It's back to the corporation. We know every card in hand. The corporation is going to go greasing the palm. We know they have it in hand. Cross that off. And they put a card in front of R&D. What card is that? 
We know what it is. That is the Hagen. That is a four credit res that is simply going to end the run. And we should know this. Because we've been note taking, we're gonna know what this is. Now, I don't know when Chill is playing, if you realize this was the Hagen, this is gonna come up later in, in the video, but we understand what this is, what it costs to break, and how bad the face check is. And all those are pretty good for us because it's four credits to simply end the run. That's a lot of money. Then finally, the corporations go new. Seamless launch to put two advancements. Now we know, obviously, the whole hand because they played every single card. They have no cards, and they're gonna advance the Luminal. That's the one bad agenda here. It's not too bad for them. And the corporation now gets three more clicks. They're just gonna click for three credits. All right, back to us. We get our four credits and we got to review our checklist. Welcome to the systematic Netrunner dissection. So questions, what's in the remote server? Nothing. Where are the agendas? All in R&D. Great, <laughs> two done. How do we win and how do we lose? We win by getting our breakers down and getting multi-access so we can lock the top of R&D so the agendas can't go from there into the remote server. Also running the remote server is pretty reasonable now until there's a defensive upgrade and they can res two or three more pieces of ice but we are gonna lose and or win based on how quickly we can get our multi-access down, our pressure and our breakers. So that's what we need to be doing this turn. We also know that this is a Hagen. So forcing the corporation to consider resing the Hagen for four credits to keep us out of an access from R&D and our Zaya credits is a very reasonable line here. If they do that, they go down to two credits and two credits is hard to play the game from because they can't threaten to res the second ice on their remote server. They can't play hedge fund and there's not a lot of economy operations for them. So I'd argue that face checking into R&D here lines up with our game plan of being aggressive early and forcing them to res their ice so they slow down. So we have more time to get into our mid to late game. Let's see what Chill does here. Also, getting down a card draw is important. We talked about that. Chill's going to draw and finds a Hermes. We don't need to get that down now because, again, there's no agendas that are going to be scored next turn. Continues to draw and finds a Paladin Puemo. She's a very good econ card. We want to get her down. Turn three is fantastic. She gives you credit a turn. And then Chill just drops down the Paladin and the Earthrise Hotel. I think that's good. We did draw, draw, and then we didn't install things until we were getting to the end of the turn. That's generally how you want to structure things. Draw first, install last. But we didn't run R&D. I think there's something to be said that you could consider not running R&D because we have a Hermes in hand and ideally that's a good target to bounce if the corporation scores out. But I think here forcing the corporation to pay four credits to deny us our credit and our uh, access from Zaya is actually kind of important because if there's an agenda that goes from R&D into the remote server, we're kind of struggling now. So it's an option. I think being aggressive here is pretty reasonable, but at least we have a really good setup. We're drawing two cards a turn. We have Paladin and a former cards for a daily cast. That was a good setup turn that we took off from our aggression. It could be aggressive though. And it's back to the corporation. For the first time, they draw an unknown card. And the corporation is going to draw. They draw into increasing the palm. They're going to draw again. They draw into a Rashida. And they're going to increasing the palm to install a card in server one. And with Ace of Group, they can install another card in server one. That was a very cool turn. They drew everything they wanted in the same server. And after we do a start of turns or Earthrise Hotel, we don't have to make any decisions here. The order doesn't matter. We're going to have to ask ourselves the questions again. All right. So our turn starts and we have our three questions to answer. How do we lose? How do we win? This in the remote server technically could be an agenda. And this is the problem that we're realizing. If the cards go from R&D, the agendas go from R&D into HQ and from HQ straight into the remote server, we have no way of dealing with two pieces of ice and a defensive upgrade. Why? Because we don't have our icebreakers down. We don't have our boomerangs. We don't have our inside jobs. So the way that we both win and lose this game is predicated on us finding our breakers. Our economy is pretty good going into the next couple turns. We also don't have any multi-access, but these are the things that we need to solve on the upcoming turns. And that's great. We have enough card draw. We probably are going to click to draw on this turn, but we need to go deeper into our deck. We also can put pressure the corporation. We can slow them down. Again, half their money is spent resing this hog. And if we want to check into R&D, if we did our note taking and we remember what this is and all of that, of course, is going to be really important. Now, the next two questions are actually kind of hard to answer. The second one, where are the agendas? Uh, we've seen two agendas so far in the top 11 cards of the deck. This is a heuristic that we're going to be using commonly throughout the video, and it's a heuristic I'd recommend you uh, kind of using in just about every Netrunner game you play. It's worth noting, most corporation decks in the standard format are playing somewhere between arguably 6 to 11 agendas. This deck specifically is playing 49 cards, and it's playing 9 different agendas in it which means nine and 49 on average, one in every 5.4 cards drawn is an agenda. We're gonna round that down to a very clean one in five. And so for every five cards drawn, we expect there to be one agenda. If we look here at 38, that means with the 49 card deck, we've gone through 11 cards so far. So seeing two agendas and 11 cards is actually what we expect. It doesn't mean that the card in their mode server is or isn't an agenda, but these are the sort of things that are going to matter on later turns after there's a lot of card draw and there's a bunch of cards in HQ or we haven't seen agendas in a long time. 
those sort of numbers will matter a bit more in the next coming turns. Just keep that in mind. The rule of five will be coming to back to that a fair bit. On this board state, it's hard to get good value from that information. Now, the final question, what's in the remote server? Generally, we don't know. We haven't seen a Rashida yet. We haven't seen Spin Doctors yet. Those are generally the common three ofs you expect in most standard decks. Also, if the corporation drew into an agenda there, they're more likely to jam it into the remote server because it seems much safer behind two pieces of ice on top of what could be a defensive upgrade than simply behind a drafter against, you know, a runner who generally likes to run central servers. So we don't have a good read here, but we do know that we can't run this. So there's not much we have to do about it besides bring ourselves to a point in the next turn where if there is an agenda in the remote server, we can run it. And that's going to largely answer what our turn is. We could always consider running R&D, mind you. We know this is a Hagen, and forcing the corporation to spend half their money just to keep us out and us getting a credit on a single axis is not bad whatsoever. But we do need to set up and we need to keep drawing through our deck. So I think Shield realizes that and spends some good turns drawing. There's a chance there's an agenda in their remote server. And so getting the Hermes down here is also not too bad. The corporation does score out. We can return the ice on R&D to back to hand. And that could be nice that we have an open R&D. But we'll see how Chill sets up here because we definitely need to be going deeper through our deck. Now, Chill installs a Hermes, which I think is a nice thing to do this turn, but then does draw, 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 and we're going to discard a card. We're saying discarding cards is fantastic. Uh, we discard an extra Paladin Puemo. She's unique, so not a real cost. And very importantly in Netrunner, if you don't have the cards you need in hand, just draw and discard the worst card in your hand because we lose if we don't get our breakers. So at any cost, even if we're discarding, you know, useful cards, we need to get deeper through our deck. So overdrawing and discarding is totally fine. Obviously, the unique clause makes it a bit more acceptable, but don't be afraid of discarding cards. But the big thing I want to say here is that the sequencing of the turn there was no difference of us installing Hermes on click one as opposed to click four because we were not running at any point in time. It doesn't change what we do on our turn. So strictly on this turn, it is always better on click one instead of installing the Hermes, mind you, using Paladin Puemo is nice, is we draw because there's a small chance that the card we draw here changes how we play the rest of the turn because us getting the Hermes down on click one versus click four won't change how we play the turn. Imagine we drew into a bravado. Imagine we drew into an inside job or a boomerang. All of those top decks would actually change how we played the turn. We could consider bravadoing R&D to force a hog and res. Otherwise, we get four credits in an axis, five credits in an axis, excuse me. If we got an inside job. We consider inside jobbing the remote server to force the corporation to res the outermost ice here. And then that's OK for us. So as soon as much as possible, when you're planning your turn, you don't want to commit to a single click until you kind of have an idea what the rest of your clicks in your turn are. It's tricky when you're drawing cards because every single card draw can change the entire web of what the turn is. So the next thing you want to say, OK, I want to install this card this turn. That's really great to know. But do you need to install it on click one or does it make a difference if you install it on click four? And usually it doesn't matter if you install it on click four. So install it on click four because then we have more turns to draw. And then if we get a run event, we feel like we need to run. We're running sooner into the turn into HB, which again is one of the basic rules we said. If we're going to be running, we're not trying to do it on the last click. So what we ended up doing on the turn, the end result, I think, was fantastic. I think just the order we got there, you can make simple changes. We weren't punished, but uh, yeah, you definitely want to be installing later and then drawing sooner. Turns out the remote server is Rashida. The first one we've seen for the corporation. They're going to draw three cards and gain three credits, and that is really good. Here, they now start with four cards in hand. We have no none of them. Uh, they're going to put something in remote server. They're going to install on top of it with Asa Group, and they're going to do advance, advance, and they'll pass the turn to us. Our startup turn triggers, order doesn't matter. We're going to start with two more cards in hand with Earthrise Hotel. We have some multi axis with twinning and some more money with Sure Gamble. And now we have a fair bit to talk about because divide by five is now suddenly going to really matter. Now, we're going to answer two other questions at the same time. Where are the agendas and what's in the remote server? We think what's in the remote server is an agenda. It's an advanced card, and a lot of advanced cards in HB turn out to be agendas. Specifically on this board state, we are not showing any breakers. The corporation doesn't think we can challenge a two ice remote server without any breakers, let alone on top of what looks like two defensive upgrades. And they're not technically correct about this. We actually can challenge this remote server, but it makes sense that the corporation thinks they have a scoring window here. So I bet that that advanced card is an agenda. Secondly, Rashida just fired. And whenever a corporation draws a lot of cards in a single click, things like a Rashida, Yahim, a predictive planogram, whenever the corporation mass draws suddenly, you need to build this sort of like spidey sense that a light goes off in your head because we talked about it. Every five cards drawn is generally one agenda. So when the corporation draws three with Rashida, one off a mandatory draw, they just drew four cards. The chance of that being an agenda within those four is really, really high. And that's exactly what happened here. Rashida fired, they jam an agenda. And that's a very common play pattern. You're going to see it across a lot of scoring corporations. 
coming back to the divide by five rule, we have 34 cards left in R&D, which means we've drawn 15 cards so far. So if we divide that by five, that means we should see three agendas in the game. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're assuming one in the remote server and then two in our score areas. So all these sort of heuristics line up to give you a pretty good idea of what most games should be looking like based off of all these numbers. Of course, the corporation can flood up really bad. Rashida could have fired. They could have drawn four agendas. It's just not very likely, but potentially they can. And potentially there is an agenda in HQ here, but I'd argue we have some pretty good lines here to figure out if we want to challenge us or not. And let's talk about Chill's turn here. Now, the card in the remote server is installed double advance, which in some ways makes it look like a 5-3 agenda. The corporation next turn can do advance, advance, advance and score out. Specifically, the 153 agenda we're expecting to see in this deck is Ikua Project. And we have to respect Ikua Project because it looks like an Ikua Project. We're expecting Ikua Project, which means that we, if we want to challenge the remote server, we want to get in there with a click and two credits left. If we spend a lot of money and a lot of our turn getting into that remote server, we pay for defensive upgrades and then we can't steal the Ikua, we feel really bad. So this looks like an Ikua Project. And so if we want to get in the remote server, we want to respect it by having a click and two credits left. I would like to say the corporation scoring on the Ikua project here is not that bad for us because they just spend five credits for points as opposed to like doing something cool for the board state, but we definitely want to steal it if we can. Now, the corporation is also doing something really cool here. It turns out it isn't an Ikua. It is actually another remote enforcement. And the corporation here by install double advancing means next turn they can do advance, advance, score, and then they have a click to respond to the Hermes trigger. And I like that a lot. And some very clever corporations will take on some risks that jam out agendas and strange scoring patterns. So they have some time to either get their ASIC group fire on the turn that they score out the agenda or repair Hermes damage. So there's a chance that this is an Ikua or there's a chance the corporation is making it look like an Ikua and or playing around Hermes. But at the end of the day, if we can get into this remote server, we definitely want to respect Ikua at the same time. And Chill here can't get into the remote server. Magnet is a three strength code gate and we have a shibboleth in hand. We break Magnet for one, we install this for free off of uh, the Pallet of Buemo. If we then boomerang the outermost dice, it's a drafter, then we can consider running the remote server on click three. We probably boomerang through whatever this is, we break the Magnet for one, and that will leave us there with uh, seven credits. And seven credits is really nice. Not only do we have a click and two credits to steal the Echo if we have it, but actually the most expected defensive upgrade you see in most HB decks is Mana Garm Skunk Works. Mana Garm Skunk Works from System Gateway, you might be familiar with this one, but it's, it makes a lot of sense. And it's another reason why we want to be running sooner in the turn than later as much as possible when we're running into HB. It's a defensive upgrade, the corporation reses for two, and we end the run unless we can spend two clicks or five credits. Spending two clicks on this turn is going to be very difficult, but spending five credits is technically possible if we exactly install the Shibboleth, exactly install the Boomerang, and run. We'll have two credits for the Ikua and five credits for this. We won't be able to trash it, which is a bummer, but we'll be potentially on game point. So I think right now we have a line to challenge the remote server as long as we do it kind of click perfect. We install the Shibboleth, we install the Boomerang, and we go right now. Chill is going to do something a bit more greedy. So Chill puts down the twinning here. The twinning is an important part of our game plan. We talked about how getting our multi-axis down and getting it down sooner than later is nice because it only charges itself once per turn and then starts to install the breakers we need to challenge the remote server. Shibboleth comes in for zero credits off the Paladin. It's the first time a turn that we used uh, a credit off of an installed card, so twinning gets a charge. Then we put the boomerang down and then we run server one. So it's the exact same line, but the most important thing here is we no longer have a click and two credits. So while we can get through this remote server and it turns out there actually isn't any defensive upgrades, which is going to be a surprise, we're going to find out, we can't steal an Ikua if there's an Ikua in there. And it's only because we were a bit greedy and we wanted to get the twinning down sooner than later so we can get an additional greedy charge on it. And it's important that we get the twinning down, but I think the extra click that we use to respect the Ikua is probably more important than getting the twinning down one turn sooner. Also very noteworthy, we have a career fair in hand, so we technically could have career fair down to twinning and saved three credits. That probably would have been better. We'd have more money here if we needed to do with defensive upgrades and stuff like that. But I don't know if we put the twinning down here because specifically we want to be running sooner in the turn than later for a whole bunch of reasons in HB. And a big one right now is the agenda that this looks like it is. Otherwise though, we're doing the aggressive thing. We're forcing the corporation to res and that's good. They res a drafter. They spent three credits. We've seen the second drafter. We boomerang that. We get through the magnet, we break it for one credit, we're in, and now the corporation here could res a Managarm or any other defensive upgrade, and they don't, which is surprising. So we get to access a card, we're gonna access the advanced card first, that's usually correct, and we see a remote enforcement. So here, we're really lucky that we did not find the Ikua, which we wouldn't have been able to steal here, and we would have held pretty bad about it. So we're gonna steal that, Paladin gets a credit, and we can return a card to hand with Hermes. 
Our options are the two cards in the remote server. We know they're both upgrades or the ice on R&D, and we're going to go for one of the upgrades that's been in the remote server for the longest. It's a bit confusing to think what the upgrades are, considering they were not resed. I would argue that the corporation here had a huge incentive to res the ganked. I'm not sure why they didn't, because they would have got ice on the table cheaply and they could fire their ASIC group ability, but unfortunately they, didn't, they did not res the Tucana, which I think would have been pretty good. Now the card we hit here is ganked, and that is the card that we're accessing, the card we didn't bounce, it was random which one you bounce, so it happens, and now the corporation is going to get to do their ganked loop thing. And so now we're off to the loop. So the ganked gets trashed, which forces us to encounter the drafter. The drafter fires and they can add a card from archives to HQ. So they're basically going to recur every single card in the bin back to hand. Uh, so they're going to add the seamless launch back to hand. And this is where note taking again is really important because at the end of this loop, we're going to know like five cards or six cards in hand. And we need to remember that it's really easy to forget all those six cards. The second subroutine on the drafter will fire, which allows them to install a card from archives or HQ. So they reinstalled the ganked. Uh, that means they can use the ASA trigger so they can install a card from hand. They add the Tucana. Uh, we access the Tucana first and don't trash it. That's totally fine. It'll just be returned to hand anyways. So eh, you don't really want to trash that there. And then we access the ganked again, which we have to access. It throws into the drafter and this just keeps happening. Again, we did a deck dive on a, this sort of deck to explain these combos. They can be pretty rude. And I'd argue if the runner res the um, the Tucana, this could be even worse for the for the for the runner here. But in short, after this all resolves, every single card in the bin will be added to the corpse hand. This feels more demoralizing than it is. This is actually not the end of the world. We're technically on game point. We stole the remote enforcement. We now know most of the cards in the corporation's hand and we did not lose our board state, which is the best thing. Overall, we're doing okay. But here we should know again, we know five cards in the hand. We know there's a Rashida. We know there's two greasing the palms. We know there's a ganked, but we are on, on game point. We have started to build our multi-axis. We have good enough card draw coming in and we have our first breaker as much as is now at strength one. We're doing okay. We did not respect, however, the Iqua, and we could have been punished hard on the remote server. The corporation could have been on game point there. We would still have been ganked to the drafter, which would have been pretty annoying, but we're doing okay. And of course, we want to be running sooner on the turn than later. That twinning was a bit greedy. And there's also some reasons where with the gank loop, you want to have a click left because of on sell, but we're not going to get exactly into that. It's up to the corporation, back to them. They have eight cards in hand, of which we know many of them. So the corporation, no surprise, greasing the palms, something in the remote server. They install an ice in front of it. They put something else in the remote server with greasing the palm. And then they just simply click for credit. Our starter turn triggers, Earthrise Hotel, Daily Cast, Paladin, Puemo. We got some more card draw and a Chesva, which at some point will be nice for central servers. So the big thing here is, again, the three questions. How do we lose the game? We lose the game where there's now a bunch of upgrades in the remote server and three ice, and we have one icebreaker. We have to stop the chain of getting the agendas from R&D into the remote server. It's really easy to look at these sort of like clown car remote servers to be like, oh, it's a bunch of hellish upgrades and three ice. I can never run that. How are we going to win the game? And very luckily, this Zaya deck is actually really good at winning the game because it's only a matter of time before we can run R&D and see four cards. And then they just simply cannot draw into an agenda. There's a very important concept in Netrunner called R&D lock. The idea is that if we see the top three cards of R&D and we don't we don't see any agendas or we steal all the agendas, it's very hard for the corporation to draw an agenda because they're only drawing the cards that we've seen and all the cards we've seen we know are not agendas. So barring any shuffle effect or any mass card draw effect, Spin Doctor, mind you, is very good at breaking R&D lock. We can just R&D lock the corporation. We know this is a Hagen. We know it's res for four credits. We know we can break it eventually pretty cheaply. But we just want to make sure we're getting in there and we're seeing um, enough cards. The corporation cannot get the agendas in the remote server. So while we're going to fail to contest this remote server probably for a couple of turns, I'd argue it's fine as long as we can get our pressure on central servers. Second question that we're going to answer is what's in the remote server. And I think we can say with some sort of assuredness that we expect there to be a Rashida in the remote server. That is largely because, again, we've been note taking and we know the corporation had a Rashida in hand and they're going to jam it in here. There's a chance that they have an agenda in hand and they jammed the agenda in this there. And that's fine, too. This is not something we can really contest if it's an agenda that's honestly going to be a problem for us. But we're expecting this to be Rashida. Regardless what's in this remote server, we can't really challenge it. So we're in a better spot to either pressure centrals or set up for the next couple turns where we need to pressure centrals. But there's a small chance that there's an agenda in there, but we're more expecting it to be the Rashida that we know that they just recurred. Now, if we want to do the where the agendas count, we think if there's an agenda in HQ, it probably go on the remote server because it's much safer there. And the corporation has a very pretty clear scoring window, which we cannot contest this. But otherwise, we've gone through 16 cards. 16 divided by five is pretty close to three. And we've seen three agendas here. So we're kind of on track to what we expect. So there could be an agenda in the remote server. But I'd say with those numbers, it's much more likely it's the Rashida Yahim we just recurred to hand. So how do we plan our turn? We are still working on getting our card draw up. 
We understand that we could force the corporation to res the Hagen. I think at this point, Chill might not have remembered that this was a Hagen, uh, considering we haven't been aggressive on R&D. But regardless, drawing deeper into our deck to find our uh, our killer, to find our fractor or inside jobs, boomerangs, all that sort of stuff seems really important here. Going HQ, also not exactly a possibility, but I don't think there's an agenda in HQ, very importantly, because if there was, it would probably go to the remote server sooner than anything else. So here, we definitely want to set up. We want to get down our uh, class act. It's also important now we have this mini goal, is that Twinning can only charge once a turn if we use a credit off the Paladin Puemo. So every turn, we want to install a card to charge that Twinning. This is a really big threat that just grows bigger and bigger. So we want to just make sure that we're installing a non-connection card. And I don't know if I would play the turn like the way that Chill did, but I really like the way that Chill played this turn. Chill basically realizes, you know, we need to get the card draw down, we need to install a card. So they just kind of dump their hand in a kind of an elegant way. So firstly, they career fair down the class act. It's nice. I think Chill tries to get a credit off the Paladin Puemo. There's a realization Paladin Puemo can't install connections. That's often missed. Uh, JDNet has your back. So we're just going to rewind that. So class act comes down for one credit. Then we're going to play Sure Gamble. We're going to install a Wake Implant, which is our HQ pressure card. We've been barely mentioning this card. It's nice that it comes down for free with the Paladin Puemo. It does a meat damage, which gets a Chesva out of hand. We had two, so it's fine. We'll lose a Chesva. And then we'll install the second Chesva. So we did everything we wanted to do this turn. Class Act is going to draw some nice cards. That's fantastic. At the end of the turn, we have the Chesva down, which is another way to charge Paladin Puemo if we're not installing cards, if we're running central servers, and we have the Wake Implant down. I'd argue the Wake Implant down, we don't actually really need here. It was a nice way of getting it down that didn't really risk too much in hand. We didn't need two Chesvas. But the big problem with Wake Implant is we don't have a real big way to pressure HQ unless we exactly draw into our Carmen or some way to get into HQ. It's a really powerful ability and now puts pressure on two big central servers. And even if there are no agendas in HQ, it's a nice way that we can get value that we'll eventually transition into R&D. It's nice to get down, but I don't think we need it for this board state. It was a pretty clean setup turn. Class Act finishes by drawing four and we have our Fractor. So now we actually can threaten R&D. We have an inside job, so we can actually challenge remote servers. We can challenge central servers that have two ice and we have a bit more card draw and a bit more money. We're in a pretty good spot here. And remote server, no surprise, it's the Rashida and the corporation's gonna draw four cards and they're gonna do the thing we expect them to do. Double install on the remote server. They're gonna put ice on R&D and then they're gonna click for credit. Start of our turn, no start turn triggers besides Paladin Puemo. So this is a very important start of turn because we have some very interesting questions to answer. Our first question doesn't really change that much from where we've been so far and we're seeing possibly how we lose the game. We lose the game when the corporation puts a bunch of defensive upgrades in a remote server, throws a bunch of ice in front of it, and we just can't deal with it soon enough. We just can't find our breakers, and that's a problem. And potentially there's an agenda in the remote server, and the corporation can be on game point as soon as possible. In fact, we know they have a seamless launch in hand, so any 4-2 agenda they can score on the remote server on the upcoming turn. Now, how do we win? Well, we, again, like we've been saying before, we disrupt that pipeline. We stop the cards going from R&D, the agenda's going from R&D into HQ and to the remote server. We're almost getting there. We have a 20 with a lot of charges. We have two of our breakers so far. The third one has eluding us, but if we can start locking the top of R&D, that's how we win and also how we not lose. So we're getting there. But the other two questions on this turn, where are the agendas and what's in the remote server are so interesting here. And there's so much to learn about this specific turn, about how the corporation played and some very basic numbers when it comes to divide by five. So Rashida just went off. Whenever Rashida goes off, again, that light has to turn on in your head to say like, oh, they just drew four cards. Four is close to five. They probably drew an agenda. If we're assuming they probably drew an agenda, where would the agenda go? Would they keep the agenda in their hand, which is kind of soft behind a single drafter and let alone we just put down a wake plan. So it seems like we really want to be running HQ or would they put in the remote server where it's safe behind three pieces of ice, a bunch of defensive upgrades, and they have a schemeless in hand. They probably put it there. So if the corporation drew a single agenda off that Rashida, which is close to what we expect, it would be in the remote server. If we also look at R&D, we've gone through 20 cards yet. We are in 29 of 49, and out of 20 divided by five, we expect four agendas to be in circulation in the game at this moment. And currently we see three in score areas, and the fourth being in the remote server makes a lot of sense. So the chance of the corporation drawing multiple agendas off that Rashida is technically there. It's about, I think, about 14%. We we're going to look at some numbers in a second, but it's not very likely. So I would think if the corporation drew into a single agenda, which lines up with a heuristic, it's in the remote server. I think HQ right now is clean. I think another really big thing that tells that HQ is clean here is this ice. The corporation ice up R&D instead of HQ. I think putting down the wake implant is a bit of a tell that we have some interest in running HQ. Now, we didn't have cards in hand after we put the wake implant down, so it's not that we had our killer there or a boomerang. We did just draw four, but we have huge incentives on this turn to be running HQ to start charging our wake implant. 
And the corporation could have iced up the drafter to prevent us from getting there, but they didn't. They iced up R&D instead. And I think there's something to be said about taking the corporation's word for it on based on how they set their board state up. But here they have good incentives to ice up HQ. And if they had another agenda in HQ, they probably would ice this up sooner than they would ice up R&D. Considering we haven't been running R&D for a while and HQ is a server that we have so many good reasons to run. Wake Implant, Rashida, all that sort of stuff. But they didn't. And there's a good reason they didn't. The corporation realizes here, we see on the replay, that all six agendas left and are still in R&D. If we start doing the thing that we want to do, which is run R&D and C3 cards with the twinning, we're going to make, start locking the corporation and we're, they're not going to draw into an agenda and they simply can't win the game. So they put another ice there because they understand that we might know this is a Hagen. We're probably at the point where we can break a Hagen. So getting two ice there to keep us off of a twinning is the way that they don't lose the game. So I think the numbers don't suggest there's another agenda in HQ. I think the ice placement suggests that all the agendas are in R&D and or there can be one in their mode server as much as we're not very capable this turn of dealing with that. Now, all these things can be relatively subtle, but for this sort of fundamentals deck where the only unfair thing we can do is figure out where to send the twinning to C3 cards, it's so important that at the beginning of every turn, we're challenging ourselves to try and address this problem. Where are the agendas? And divide by five gets you mostly there. Understanding how the corporation is playing, understanding that at this point in time, we expect to see four agendas. There's probably something in the remote server. So I don't think HQ is flooded. They put an ice on R&D. Why would they do that? All these sort of things will push you forward to get to the point that we can use this multi-axis uh, as intelligently as possible. Now, a bit of a spoiler, Chill plays his hand differently. Chill goes here for the HQ, multi-axis goes for the pressure, and there's some good reasons to do that. But if we're trying to answer the question of where their agenda is, the answer here is kind of screaming R&D. And we actually can, on this turn, threaten to see the top three cards of R&D. And I'll show you some numbers in a second of what the probability is of running HQ and it working and R&D and it working. And it's a huge, huge change here, especially because our game plan is locking the top of R&D to make sure the corporation is not drawing anything. But let's see what we want to do on our turn regardless, because we do have a bunch of these like once per turn kind of mini goals that we want to do. And I really like this in Netrunner. So for instance, on our turn, if we want to plan our turn, we definitely want to be drawing once a turn if we can, because our first draw turn is that sort of scry draw where we draw one more and we bottom one. So getting class active fire every turn is a really good thing. We also want to make sure twinning is getting a counter every turn. That's a really important part of our win condition. So either we need to install a non-connection with Paladin Puemo, or we need to be running a central server. We need to be at least boosting or breaking with one of our icebreakers or trashing something with the Chesva. So those are the two things we want to do. While we want to be running sooner than later on our turn, we can't make many very smart runs here. So Chill is going to open by drawing cards. This is an interesting choice. We have Sure Gamble, which is money. And for what it's worth, our money is not bad. We have 10 credits here, one Paladin, two on Chesva. We have another daily cast. I think taking the Earthrise here is reasonable. I think you could go either way. We have another class second in hand if we want to, but getting the Earthrise Hotel down so we can find our killer is also going to be kind of important. So we're going to draw for that. Now, Chill installs two cards and then inside jobs HQ. So there's a bunch of things we can say about this and specifically running with no clicks left. We've talked about this and we're going to continue to talk about this. It's a really risky thing to do against a deck like this. We'll just, we'll later address the fact that there's probably no agendas in HQ, but even if there was, we're playing around that Iqua project, which again, requires us to spend a click and two credits. And the fact that we're running here on last click means we just simply cannot interact with six points in the deck. That is the agenda that technically would be most likely in HQ here, because I'm not sure if the corporation wants to jam out an Iqua on this board state, but at the end of the day, all the Ikawas on the entire table are entirely safe because we're running last click. And the, the thing is, like, there's no reason for us to run last click. This is something we mentioned a couple turns ago, but installing daily cast on click two or click three or click four doesn't change inherently our whole turn. So if we want to make this play, we should definitely be inside jobbing on click two. And then after we've accessed, after we responded to any of the information we gain from this run, then we can play the daily cast. Then we can play the Earthrise Hotel because getting this down earlier and later doesn't matter. So at any point in the Netrunner turn, you want to plan your turn fully. And if you're installing cards that don't interact with the board state, you always want to be first getting accesses to gain information or drawing cards, which again gains you information. You want to collect all the information you can generally, and then you want to capitalize on the information by just putting your cards down that you want to. So we're sending it in here with an inside job. Now, I don't want to dogpile too hard on this, but just to give you some other ideas, there's a lot of other reasons why running last click can be bad for you. We know this deck specifically is playing ganked, and if we access the ganked in HQ, it's going to throw us back into the drafter. And as we said before, firing drafter on last click is kind of a disaster because the corporation can just install a Rashida into a new server and we can't deal with it. It's just going to fire. We'd love to have the click left to be able to deal with that if we need to and respond to whatever happens. 
Another reason too is like Hermes technically here could fire. And if we do steal an agenda and Hermes fires, we could consider bouncing the outermost dice here. Maybe we can run R&D. Maybe we can bounce something else. We can bounce the card on the remote server. There's just a bunch of reasons why you want to have clicks left to respond to the information you've gained, specifically when it comes to things like Hermes, let alone the whole HB card pool, as we've been saying at length. Now, one thing it is worth mentioning is that this run will pay us off pretty well. The idea here is we're going to see three cards, so we're going to get three credits. That's nice. It means Zaya's ability fires and you feel good about it. But I do want to warn is that when we talk about how we're going to win the game and how we're going to lose the game, the way that we win the game is by locking the top of R&D and trading our R&D pressure on the twinning. And we do have more twinning counters than we need here for uh, some extra credits is us trading our win condition when we could just be clicking for credits anyway. So it's not the best trade on this board state. We're going to go see three full three from HQ. Um, so we'll see how it goes. We see a seamless launch. This is the one card we knew. Again, that's good to know. It's still there, of course. We see a spin doctor. At least here we can also use the Chesva credits to trash things. That's not too bad whatsoever. So we're going to go ahead and trash that. And then we access a Tukana. We could trash this if we want to. We're pretty sure there's a Tukana in the remote server. In fact, we know there is. We can trash that if we want. And we're going to go ahead and gain our three credits. One good thing about the HQ run is that we got the Waken Plan charge. So that's not too bad. We can use that R&D. So technically we spent a counter to get a counter on something else. But the chance of us seeing an agenda there was really low. Now, this sort of dissection of where the agendas are is actually incredibly important because at the end of the day, this deck inherently is just a multi-axis deck. The only way that we can win is using our limited resource, which is the sort of charging multi-axis and using it at the right place at the right time. So it's really important that we are very strict on trying to answer the question at the beginning of every turn of where are the agendas? Because if we're missing the agendas, we're using our limited resource and obviously not winning the game. Now here on this turn, again, we talked about how the HQ run might not make sense. And I'm going to show you a different line that we had access to. And I'll show you the difference on the expected chance of us finding an agenda because it is night and day. So at the beginning of this turn, when we started here, we had another line we had access to. Now this does hinge on the fact that we're note taking when we realize the innermost here is a Hagen, which is a barrier we can break. But here for click one, we can consider dropping the Kurapira. For click two, we can inside job the R&D. And that means that we'll break this Hagen for relatively cheap with the support of the Chesva credits. If the corporation wants to keep us out from seeing three cars on R&D, they have to res both these ice. And even then, we still get through. It's been a couple of turns since we've forced the corporation to res any amount of ice and spend any amount of credits because of what we're doing. So you always kind of want to do that. 12 credits resing two ice, that goes down pretty quickly. But no matter what, on that line, we're guaranteed to get into R&D and we're guaranteed to see three cards. We can look at the numbers here. It's kind of shocking how big of a difference it is. Right now, we're in a board state where we think there is an agenda in the remote server, three agendas in the score area. That leaves us five agendas. So we think there's five agendas and 29 cards, and we're going to be seeing three of them. We'll look at the numbers of how that is. But if we consider the HQ run that we just made, that HQ run only connects with an agenda. If on the previous turn, when the corporation fired a Rashida right here, that out of the four cards they drew, two of them were agendas. Because one will go into server one for sure, and the other one will be staying in hand. So our chance of finding an agenda on this run on HQ is predicated that the Rashida finds two agendas, and we can see the numbers on that chance. So if we check out a hypergeometric distribution, this is the numbers going into the Rashida fire. When the Rashida fired, the corporation had 33 cards in deck. There were six agendas in the deck. They drew a sample size of four. The chance of the Rashida drawing two or more agendas is only 14%. So the chance of us getting into HQ and multi-accessing and stealing an agenda is less than 14%. Now, of course, there were already cards within HQ before the Rashida fired, but based off of the way they played the turn before and they had a scoring window, we can kind of say that those are probably not agendas. We knew one of them was a seamless launch, but there's only a, less than a 14% chance that if we run HQ with that twinning the way that we did, that we find an agenda. However, if we look at the stats or if we run R&D, when there was 29 cards left and we inside job R&D, we thought there was five agendas left in the deck there because we thought the fourth was in the remote server. We see three cards. The chance of us finding at least one agenda is 45%. That's a huge difference. Sub 14 to 45 is night and day. And it turns out our numbers were actually wrong. We didn't know this, but there's actually still six agendas in R&D. So if we run the numbers on that. The chance of us finding an agenda on R&D on that 20 axis, which could just win us the game, is 52%. Now, these numbers sometimes aren't intuitive, and I'd recommend every once in a while pulling up the hypergeometric calculator. I don't have this like down. I don't think anyone does. But it's the sort of thing that, especially when you're looking at your replays, you can easily dump those numbers and kind of calculate the odds of any expected value for any multi-axis to work out for you. 
That's a really big difference because again, at the end of the day, inherently our runner deck is just, uh, the only way we win is by using our multi-axis intelligently. Also, we talked about how locking the top of R&D is incredibly important. And on this turn, we had two options and one of them was way better than the other. Again, it was also predicated on remembering this was a barrier. So do your note taking, but we had two lines here. The inside job on HQ, a bit expensive. It doesn't work out for us, but not the end of the world. So now we end our turn and the plot actually continues to thicken. The corporation draws into a card we don't know. It's a Tranquility Home Grid. Mind you, at the beginning of the video, this is one of the other cards you could expect to be in the early remote server. It costs a lot to trash. And the corporation here, unfortunately, accidentally reses another Tranquility Home Grid in their remote server. This card is really powerful. It is worth trashing if you can get in there, but with the first time a turn they install something in the remote server, they can either gain two credits or draw one card. And that's a lot of free value clicklessly doing the thing that you're going to do anyways. I think the corporation res this because they thought they could jam the second Tranquility Grid in that server to get a card draw or two credits. Uh, unfortunately, you can only have one region per server, so this is going to get resed when there's actually no targets in hand. So we're going to get a lot of information out of this. Unfortunately, it is a mistake, but we're going to still work with that information. And so now you expect first click the corporation to install something in their remote server, but they don't. They draw. Second click, okay, they'll put something in their remote server for sure. They don't. They draw. And then third click, they install ice on HQ. This is so telling, and we get away with a lot of information here because the corporation res the tranquility, maybe on accident, but they don't get its ability to fire. This tells us a bunch of things. Firstly, we know that this card on top of the tranquility, which was installed with Asa, can't be an agenda. It's probably not an asset because if it was a Rashida or a Spin Doctor, all of those things would have been resed ahead. So we're pretty sure it's just a bunch of upgrades in this remote server. We don't have to run this remote server. Secondly, if the corporation drew anything that they could put in the remote server, they probably would because we're not that much better at challenging the remote server. They have a bunch of upgrades on there and they definitely would install something in there because it's a clickless card draw, which is what they were doing anyways, or two credits. So to me, we have to start answering some questions and we have some really obvious answers to some of our important start of turn questions. Let's do our start of turn triggers. Earthrise Hotel for two daily casts. We get to see three cards here, bottom one. Uh, not a big choice here. We don't need another copy of Hermes. So to the bottom it goes and we can start our turn. Let's talk about our three questions. What's in the remote server? Just upgrades. It's worth mentioning it sometimes is correct to run the remote server to deal with upgrades before it matters, but we can't do that, and that's great. We also have to ask the question, where are the agendas? And there's no agendas in HQ, and we should be able to tell that. Because if the corporation had an agenda, it would go straight into server one. Now, this is something that comes up a lot, especially when teaching new players Netrunner. I've seen this line and thinking a lot. If the corporation is drawing, when they spend a lot of turns. They drew three cards that turn. If we think about the divide by five rule, you might think, well, they drew three cards that turn. It's not unlikely there's something in HQ. And specifically on this sort of board state, it's actually truly the opposite. The corporation did not draw on their last click. Specifically drawing on your last click is one of the riskiest things you can do as a corporation because if the corporation drew into an agenda, it'll just sit there in hand and we have ways to access cards from HQ, twinning. We kind of want to run HQ every turn if we can cheaply. But more importantly, the corporation clearly is drawing here to get an agenda in the remote server and they didn't find one. So obviously they're drawing here to get something in the remote server, an agenda, an asset, literally anything, but they did not find an agenda and it would be much better in this remote server, let alone on top of the tranquility grid. So if you're asking the question, where are the agendas? They're all in R and D. And we should be able to say that with such confidence, specifically because the tranquility home grid unfortunately was rezzed, but we should be able to tell with the six agendas we're expecting to be left in the game, they're all in R and D. There's six and 26, that's nearly one in four. Smashing R&D here to see three cards is very likely, let alone four cards with a can plan, is very likely to steal an agenda. This is how we should try and close the game off right now, because the corporation doesn't have any HQ and they're not in server one, so they have to be somewhere. They're currently all in R&D. That's a fantastic place for us to be. The last question, how do we lose? How do we win? We win by locking the top of R&D because the corporation doesn't have an agenda. They need to draw an agenda. We lose by getting into the remote server, so everything is going okay for us. The one issue, is we don't know if we can get into R&D. We should know this is a Hagen, which we can break with the Kura Pira, but we don't have a way to deal with the outermost. Our deck has inside jobs, it has boomerangs, of course we have our last breaker, but here we could consider just running R&D after we get a Kura Pira down to force some ice reses. The corporation doesn't have a lot of money and they're gonna have to keep us out at all costs from R&D because everyone here should know the entire game is in R&D. So we still have all our mini goals on our turn. We want to charge the twinning every turn, either by installing it with Paladin Puemo or using the Chesva during a central run. We've already used the class act, so we don't need to draw this turn, but we're still trying to, we're in the situation where we technically can lose the game because we don't have our killer and we might not be comfortable at contesting R&D because we might be scared of the outermost. And I'd argue that the outermost, a face check here firing, if it is something like the drafter, it is kind of a problem for us. 
So to some extent, the face check on this at this point in time can be scary. We might want to slow down. We might want to wait until we get all our breakers out. And with only 16 cards left in the stack, technically it's less because we know the bottoms because we bottomed them with a class act. We're going to sooner than later find our Carmen, our uh, last killer that we need here, or just an inside job or a boomerang. So first click we draw. It makes sense. You want to draw sooner than anything as we draw into a bravado here. Don't have a great server to run here. We can consider running R&D. We know the innermost is a Hagen. If the corporation reses the outermost, it could be pretty bad for us. We're going to continue drawing again. We need to find our breaker. We found a second bravado. Third click here, we could install a card there. We're going to install the Kurapira. So we have a Fractor. We're just missing our killer. We also hit the twinning. And then last click, we're going to bravado into R&D. This is such a risky run on this board state. And I argue that we're doing relatively well. That one bad run here actually could cost us a heck of a lot. Firstly, the outermost, if that is the final drafter, which is kind of unlikely because we've seen two, those subroutines will fire. And that means the corporation can install a card from archives into server one. If they get the Rashida or the Spin Doctor in there, not only will it give them two credits or another card draw because of the Tranquility Home Grid, that will be exactly the sort of card draw they need to find an agenda to jam into the remote server, which we're not currently capable of running. So again, running last click is a bit of a liability. We mentioned this early in the video that if we are going to face check into HB Ice, we make sure we're going to do it early in the turn because something like an on sale 1.0 has subroutines which are disastrous when we can't click through them, let alone break them. If this subroutine fires, we can lose our twinning, let alone we can lose one of our programs and we only have one of each program. Losing our decoder, losing our fractor here is an absolute disaster. So I'd argue that this is a bit more of a risky run than we need to take. If we wanted to take this risky run, we could have done it on click one. And then there's ways to respond to anything that happens. If a Rashida hits server one, we can go ahead and pinhole threading it. Like we have a bunch of options. It's just unfortunately doing this on the last click is probably the worst time to do it. And again, still, if we do manage to get in, we can't steal the Aqua projects. And there's two of them in the deck because we need to click in two credits. So we're trying to win the game with six points less in the deck. And that's not a great spot to be in, especially because we win if we do steal one. But the outermost is going to get res and it is simply a gatekeeper. This is an FFG ice. It's a really cool ice. It's res for three. So we did spend, force the corporation to spend some credits. It's good. It's been a while since we've done that. And the corporation doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, but this thing on the turn it's res is six strength code gate. That's arguably another problem with playing the bravado here is we just don't have a lot of money if we need to break ice. Uh, I don't know what we want to break. Breaking gatekeeper is actually really expensive. So more often than not, you have to let it fire. It's a lot of money to break with Shibboleth. Uh, but this gatekeeper is going to fire. It ends the run. More importantly for the rest of the game, it will be zero strength. So we break it for two credits. So it's nice to get this out of the way before it matters. That's OK. But this top subroutine is really important. Draw up to three cards, reveal up to three agendas in HQ and or archives and shuffle those agendas into R&D. Right now, we said the corporation, the problem they have is they don't have agendas. And now they are going to have agendas once they draw three cards. It's up to three. They're going to draw three. And you're going to see they find an off-world office. They find an agenda they want to jam their mode server. On top of that, now, this allows them to shuffle back agendas. So if the corporation drew into, like, heaven forbid, three agendas and they're scared about them, they can reveal them and shuffle them back. This in some ways is another like soft reason why you don't want to be running last click because we ran into this first click and the corporation res as a gatekeeper. They might feel uncomfortable keeping multiple agendas in HQ because they realize on the rest of the turn we could potentially run HQ somehow and they'd actually be taking a risk by holding multiple agendas in their hand. That's not the case on this exact board state for multiple reasons, but it's another soft reason why so much of the HB ice you want to be running in early so that you can react to the repercussions of what happens with the ice. Generally, that makes sense across most of Netrunner. So unfortunately here, the corporation drew three cards kind of like a Rashida. So we're pretty sure what they have in hand is going to go into the remote server next turn. And uh, it's not the best for us because again, that is technically the way that we lose the game. Gatekeeper going to end the run. We're going to get our money. We did most of our once per turn goals. We're going to flip back to the corporation. And at the beginning of this turn, they technically drew four cards. Rashida light goes off. We should be able to figure out what they have, if they have an agenda and it turns out they do. And it shouldn't be a surprise. They've gone through 22 cards, so they've gone through 27. We're expecting about five agendas in play. Um, that's actually less than we see. So this is kind of less than you'd expect, but the corporation has that awful office. They'll jam it in their remote server. They'll put another upgrade on top of it. This clown car remote server is really intimidating right now. And yeah, it's kind of tricky to run that thing. That's how we said we'd lose the game. And then they're going to ice up R&D. They overinstalled on top of the gatekeeper. I think that's really smart. Uh, the gatekeeper is only two credits for us to break, so might as well get something good there. And then they single advance what turns out to be an off-world office. All right, it's back to us. Start to turn triggers. Order doesn't matter. Earthrise Hotel, draw two, bottom one. We don't need a third class act. We have one on the table, one in the hand. We don't need a third one, so we'll just go ahead and bottom that. And now we're back to answering our three questions. Firstly, what's in the remote server? It's an advanced card. We're assuming it's an agenda. The corporation is, again, 27 cards in, so they've probably drawn through about five agendas. 
I'd argue if they flooded up really bad with the gatekeeper, they might have shuffled them back. So I'm not sure if we think there's agendas in HQ. In HQ, though, we do know there is a seamless launch. Seamless launch means this agenda their remote server, if we are going to contest it, is a chance of being an ICWA, which means they can seamless advance advance. And if we want to get in their remote server, we're going to need to click in two credits. That's kind of difficult. So there is an agenda probably in remote server. I don't think it's super likely there's an agenda in HQ. There's a possibility. But otherwise, there's still a lot of agendas unaccounted for and if not anywhere else. They have to be in R&D. What are we capable of this turn? We have a lot of multi acts. If we run R&D, we see four cards. We're on technically game point. We see a three pointer. We have uh, technically access now to a boomerang, which means we can cheat through one ice of any kind. That's nice. And we have a mutual favor, which means we can also go find our Carmen if we need to. And it saves us three credits. If we run archives first if you want to do it like that. We got a lot of options. How do we lose this way? Cards go in the remote server. We haven't been locking R&D for the whole game so far. We haven't seen a card on R&D in a really long time. And that's if we put our multi-access, this stops us from happening like this. Uh, we know one card in HQ and we got to get some pressure on right now. Can we run the remote server? Probably not. Again, it's hard to have a good idea what these upgrades are. We're pretty sure it's a two con into a ganked. All the other stuff we don't know, but that's a hard server to run. So I think we're going to go for some R&D pressure here. That makes almost sense. And that's what Chill is going to do. Now, I'm pretty sure Chill does not remember that this thick card on the innermost is a Hagen. We do know it's a Hagen. And Kurapiro breaks Hagen for, we'd have to boost three, break for two. So it's five credits. Two of them can come off the Chesva. So the problem is, what is the outermost iced? It was overinstalled. Uh, that means it's probably something more annoying for us. The corporation actually can't res a lot of ice. If we run R&D here and they force them to res two pieces of ice, like there's a chance they can't score on their remote server. Mind you, seven credits goes pretty quick. Uh, but the problem is this outermost ice could be an issue for us if it is a sentry. And that's okay. I think here we have a really clean line. If we just get the boomerang outermost on the R&D ice, we can get through a sentry. We can break through two subroutines. That will get through a drafter. If it's an on-sell, we click through one subroutine. And then we know we can pay our way through the Hagen. And that means we're going to be accessing with at least a click and two credits left so we can steal off the top of the deck. Unfortunately, chill here goes for a much more, I would say, conservative line. It's a much more safe line. But I'd argue if we're note-taking, we should know what this ice is. And we're not worried about a blowout here. Because here we play really, really, really safe, but unfortunately, really, really slow. So the idea is we're running archives. This run on its own doesn't make a lot of sense, but the point for this is that we can now play mutual favor and the click that we spent on the run, we just use it on installing the program anyways. It's a bit of a wash no matter way you do it, but the program we're getting is Carmen, which now comes in for three credits cheaper because we made a successful run. So you might as well do it that way. We have finally established our whole rig. We installed this for two credits with Paladin Puemo, so twinning is charged higher than we can use on a single R&D run. But now we know that we can break all ice. This took us a couple turns to get there, and we were drawing really heavily through our deck. I don't think we were skimping on card draw, so this sometimes can happen. Play a second mutual favor if you're really worried about it. But now we can contest R&D if we run right now. We'll have nine credits to make the run. Seven in our pocket, two on the Chesva. That's probably enough because I don't think the corporation can res two pieces of ice here. So instead of the boomerang, getting down the Carmen and running, I think that's also an option. Uh, but unfortunately here, Chill does both. So Chill puts the boomerang on R&D and now runs. Also with the Bravado too. So we only have two credits and two credits to work with. That's not a lot of money. Now, of course, the Bravado is good. We could have Bravado regardless. But the thing is now the outermost dice, the one that we should have been slightly scared of, we're answering it in two ways. We spent two clicks to get the Carmen down and we spent a click to get the Boomerang down. So at the end of the day, we know this can't be double century because we know what this is. And I think Chill just missed that this was the Hagen. And again, of course, no taking. So the corporation is not going to res the outermost because it's six credits. The innermost, they will res. They're down to three credits. That's pretty good. Again, we have to force them to spend money. Their money goes pretty quickly. And the Hagen, we break for the Kurapira now for only, uh, what is it? Three, four credits. Not too bad. Unfortunately, now, there's a couple issues here. We're once again accessing without any clicks left. So we just simply can't steal Iqua. On top of that, we installed this Carmen and we didn't use it. Of course, the boomerang will just cover us on their front. And we're accessing now with even three credits less to use, which means if we access things on the top of the deck, we can't trash them. That's not a great spot to be. Again, sometimes you don't want to trash the cards because the corporation is drawing into those cards as opposed to agendas and agendas is how we lose the game. Uh, but we're at least going to see four cards here and get paid with Saya and the Bravado after that. And we're going to use all our multi axes we can, two from the twinning, one from the wake, and we're going to see four cards. Off the top, Manning Arm Skunk Works, write this down on your paper. We know the corporation is going to draw into this. We could have considered trashing this if we had money, uh, but we can't. So it's just going to be drawn. Second, a drafter. It's good to know where the third drafter is so we don't have to worry about the drafter face check. That's some good information. You write that down. Third is Rashida. Probably would trash this if we could. Unfortunately, we don't have credits. And then this is the heartbreaker. We could have won the game this turn for sure. That's the Ikoa project. We do not have the click and two credits. This is the first time we've seen an Ikoa, so Chill might not have been familiar with this card, but this is the sort of card that's pretty ubiquitous in these HB decks and making sure that we have a click and two credits is super important. 
Here, if we just did boomerang run, we would have won the game. We would have been on seven points. Uh, it's not exactly results oriented thinking because it's very likely that there's still Ikwas somewhere. We haven't seen any of them, uh, but we had a pretty safe run there with the boomerang. Now, what's really important here, if you find yourself in this situation, you don't have to reveal this to the corporation. You just say no action or no trash, and then it'll just go back on top of the R&D. Because at the end of the day, this is OK for us. Obviously, we could have won, but now we have to track that the top four cards of R&D are locked and the winning agenda is the fourth card. So on this turn, the corporation is going to mandatory draw. So we know the winning point is three cards down. And luckily, we can run and see three cards next turn. So as long as we can get back in next turn, we can go see three cards and we can still win the game. We're expecting the corporation to win out and they do or score out. Excuse me. They seamless launch. That's the card we knew in hand. We can check that off. They do seamless advance, score out an off world office, and they're going to get seven credits. They don't residue Kana for what it's worth. It hasn't mattered this game. I'd argue they might not want to because it technically shuffles the deck. And then if we go back, we see three new cards. They don't know that we saw the Iqua, so it's fine. And then we can Hermes a card here. Here, I think the card that was Hermes is the Tukana. Technically, uh, Chill knew that Tukana was there. I'm not sure if the Hermes happened so the Tukana wouldn't fire. In theory, it would have fired before anyways and it has to be rezzed. But we do know what card we return to the hand. I think, unfortunately, returning a card in the remote server is probably the, the least valuable target for us on this turn because the corporation has a click left and they have a Tranquility home grid. So it's in their best interest as much as possible to install a card in their remote server anyways so they can gain their two credits or card draw. So it's very likely they'll install whatever their target is in their remote server. Mind you, we know they have a mana garm. It could be the mana garm. And then they can just return the Tukana on top of that clicklessly. I think on this board state, if we return the ice on HQ, that's actually a lot more of an interesting play. Because if the corporation wants to re-ice HQ, and mind you, we have the Carmen, we have the Waken plant, it costs them a click and a credit, so it denies them their Tranquility home grid, and they probably don't get an Asa installed there. But again, that's okay. We know the winning point is three down on R&D, and we can see three cards this turn as long as we install a card or use our Chesva. We're going to use our Chesva for sure for running R&D. Turn to turn trigger, Earthrise Hotel draws three bottom ones. We don't need another Hermes. We have an inside job and a Docklands pass. The win is three down on R&D. We knew they draw a mana garm. The question is, what's in the remote server? For this to be the game, the corporation needs to have a 5-3 in the remote server, and they need to have double seamless launch. So on their turn, they do seamless launch, seamless launch, advance. That's super unlikely that they have all of that. I think the only card we know that they have in hand is the mana garm skunk works. So it's super unlikely that they have the Iqua, let alone we saw where the other Iqua is. So it's just kind of not the most obvious thing they could have that which means there's a chance the card in the, in the remote server is an agenda, but it's probably not going to be the agenda that wins them the game on the following turn, maybe in two turns. So what's in the remote server? Could be the Mana Garm, probably the Jukana, and then an unknown card. You always want to check archives. We've seen so far one Rashida, one Spin Doctor, so both of those are pretty likely. Turns out it is the Spin Doctor. And then the question is, how do we win? How do we lose? We win by running R&D and seeing three cards. At the end of the day, the card in the remote server actually is the Spin Doctor, and that's not entirely surprising. Uh, but if they do res the Spin Doctor, they draw two cards, which will be two of the cards we saw. I think it's a Rashida and a Drafter. And then the card underneath it will actually be our Iqua. Now, the corporation, if they see this line coming, they can always shuffle with the Spin Doctor. And at the end of the day, that's not the worst thing for us, because then we'll just end up seeing three new cars. And it's very likely one of those is the Iqua, let alone another agenda. So at the end of the day, I think here we definitely want to run R&D and see three cards. We're actually really set up to run R&D. It's super cheap and we have a boomerang data rise. I think that's what we want to do this turn. Now, Chill plays this differently. Chill goes for some HQ pressure. I think he drops the Docklands Pass and then inside jobs in on HQ. And in some ways, you know, the HQ pressure is reasonable. We're getting Zaya to fire. We're getting Wake Implant. We're seeing a bunch of cards with Docklands Pass. We know that the win is on top of R&D. So making a very similar play to this, in fact, actually just not inside jobbing, just running R&D probably gets us there and it forces the corporation to shuffle. And we're kind of happy if they do that anyways. Uh, that probably wins us the game. But specifically, this HQ run, if we're looking only for agendas, it's actually incredibly likely to be, have agendas in there if we're playing that sort of where the agenda game. Because firstly, what do we know about the corporation's hand? We knew that they just drew into a Mana Garm Skunk Works. Maybe it's in their hand, maybe in their remote server. But the most important thing is we know that the corporation did not draw into an agenda off the mandatory draw. So when could they have drawn into an agenda? The last time the corporation did a mass draw was a couple turns ago when the gatekeeper fired, right? Going into this gatekeeper turn, the corporation clearly spent most of their turn drawing. So they were looking for an agenda because the remote server looks pretty good right now and we're not challenging it. And they couldn't find one. Once the gatekeeper fired, they can draw three cards. They can shuffle back if they flooded with agendas, but they didn't. And they found one agenda that we know. Now, 
That agenda went into the remote server and they scored it out next turn. They mandatory drew. That mandatory card is a random card. It could have been another agenda. So there's a chance there is another agenda floating in HQ. It'd have to have come off of the gatekeeper or off the mandatory draw. Now that agenda would have stayed in HQ for this whole turn, right? The corporation got the agenda in the remote server, another upgrade with it. They repaired the ice on R&D and they just advanced the card. So if they drew another agenda off the mandatory draw or the gatekeeper, it would still be in hand here. Turn passed, we ran R&D, we saw the winning points. Unfortunately, we weren't able to steal it. But very importantly here, we locked the top of R&D. So now for the next three turns, we're gonna know what the corporation is drawing into. We knew they drew into a mana garm. The corporation scores an agenda and jams another card into the remote server. So if the corporation drew a second agenda off of the gatekeeper, this is the turn they put in their remote server or off the mandatory draw on their last turn. That's when they put in their remote server. So the only chance that running HQ on this exact turn finds you an agenda is if the gatekeeper and the mandatory draw following the gatekeeper was three agendas, right? Because if they drew two, they scored one and they just jammed another one right now. It's safer in there than anywhere else. So here, running HQ doesn't make a lot of sense if we're just tracking where the agendas are. Now, of course, we know the winning agenda is on top of R&D here. So I think just running R&D click one makes a very interesting play. The corporation has to res and shuffle the spin doctor and still there we see three different cards. That's pretty good for us. Uh, but here, the HQ run, unfortunately, is not going to do much for us. In such job, they don't raise the bronze, so we get past the drafter. That's nice. And we can see a bunch of cards here. Unfortunately, using our twin encounters here, while we do get a wake and plan counter, uh, is using our multi access, and we can no longer run RD and threaten to win the game. So we're going to see a bunch of cards here. We see them a virus. We don't care about this card. We have no viruses. We'll trash it for sure. Uh, we see a mana garm. We knew they had this. We can consider trashing that. We have the chest for credits, and we see a tranquility home grid. We can let that go. We also see the last card. It's a hogan. So now we know every single card in hand, and we know the next three cards in RD. This is why it's super important to know track, uh, to, to take notes, because we are, no, the next three cards in R&D, we know every card in HQ. So the only mystery we have to answer is what is this one card in their remote server? In theory, we could try to figure out what it is right now with the pinhole threading. I don't think we have to, because it's not like we can contest the remote server if we do find an agenda. Maybe it's a Rashida, we want to trash that. And we know the card on top of it's probably a Tucana. But we do now know that the winning agenda is three cards down in R&D. So we can just set up to run. If we run here on R&D, we're only going to see two cards, so we can't see it. So we're just going to click for credits. Career fair out, class act, replace the class act. You can do that. That's nice. It gets us some card draw here. Draw four cards. And so now we know what the corporation is drawing into. I believe it's a drafter. The corporation opens with a spin doctor. This is huge because now we know the corporation. We know every single card in hand. The top of R&D is entirely fresh. We know they have an Ico in hand. The winning points for both players is in hand. We also know they have a Rashida, a drafter, a Hagen, and Tranquility. We actually have perfect information on what their hand is. And now they're in a weird situation. They probably should here install Advance Advance the Ico on their remote server. Because if they don't install Advance Advance here, we know they don't have a seamless. Maybe they top deck a seamless. They're not going to win this turn. The corporation does an interesting play that kind of forks the runner. And instead, they shuffle the Spin Doctor away or they remove it the game to shuffle back a seamless launch, which they need, and a Spin Doctor. They install something in a new remote server using the Asa group. So this card could either be the Tranquility. It can either be the Rashida or it can either be the winning agenda. It'd be pretty wild to put the winning agenda out there. And then they install the Ikua into this remote server. They then just click for a credit. They could, in theory, consider advancing the ICWA project. It would make it obvious to us it's the ICWA, and that means that we can't run this remote server. It means that we can't win off central servers. They will win next turn if they top deck a seamless launch, let alone with the Rashida, and then the turn passes to us. This is a really cool board state because we should know the ICWA was, was in hand. And so the ICWA is either on the table or still in hand. Except the fact that we know every card in hand, we can actually piece this together. This is a really fun puzzle. We know this card cannot be the Tranquility Home Grid because you can't put two in a server. So this card in this remote server could be the Tranquility Home Grid. It's kind of fun and kind of wild. It's a bit of misdirection. Some players would do that to force you to run it because you think it's the Rashida and just waste your time. That is technically a play here. This is also could be the Rashida. Either of these could be the Rashida and of course, whatever the third card is and it's an HQ. Now the Rashida is actually kind of important here because if we can't contest the server and the Rashida goes off, the corporation has a chance of off the mandatory draw on the Rashida to draw into two seamless launches. Uh, there's three probably in the deck. We've seen all three are still into 20 cards in R&D, and then they can do a seamless launch, seamless launch, advance, and they would score seven points. So there's a chance that on this board state, if we specifically don't trash the Rashida, we could lose on the next turn. Now, if we trash the Rashida, they're only going to get mandatory draw, which means they can't draw and find the seamless. There's no way. So if we want to not lose next turn, which is the question we're asking at the start of turn, we have to at least trash the Rashida because otherwise they can. They have a chance. It's a small chance, but they have a chance of winning next turn. How do we win? By stealing the Ikua. 
which either is in this server, it's either in this server or it's an HQ. So we either have to make a, a bold claim that we know where it is, or we have to try and win off central servers. And running now R&D, we can see three cards in R&D. We have no interest in really running HQ unless we want the wake and plan charges because we know every single card in hand, as much as that will give us maybe some information what's in the remote server. I think this is actually a really fun puzzle how to solve this. And Chill does a start of a play, um, wants to figure out what's in the remote server. I think something that's really cool that Chill figured out is this sort of deck that's running things like uh, Tucana and is running ganked. They don't fire if you win the game. So we run the remote server, and as long as we access the Ikoa project first, if that's what it's in this remote server, we get to seven points. Tukana doesn't fire it. We never access the ganked. So at the end of the day, accessing the agenda first, none of these defensive upgrades do anything. That being said, we still have to play around some amount of defensive upgrades. We're pretty sure there might be a Mana Garm Skunk Works in this remote server. We did see some in the corpse deck. Uh, but at the end of the day, if we can deal with the Mana Garm, maybe we have to deal with another defensive upgrade. The winning agenda is in this remote server. As long as we access it first, we don't have to worry about ganked or Tukana, which is a good spot to be in because those are hard cards to play around in the middle game. At the end game, they don't do anything. So what's the line here? I think if we do some math, we could look at some probabilities. We know there's an agenda on the table. That means there's four agendas and 20. Seeing three, do you win the game? If you get a, mind you, just a Hermes bounce, there's an option that running RD here is okay. But there's also an option here that we can challenge the remote server. And the line here that Chill does is pinhole threading. And this is really valuable because we can use pinhole to trash cards, but we can also use it as a pseudo expose. So currently we pinhole here and we access the Equa project. We can't steal or trash it, but now we know that the card in server one is the Equa project, which is the game. So as long as we can get into this remote server with a click and two credits, finally, we can steal that Equa project that has just dodged around this for the last couple of turns and we can win the game. For what it's worth, I think actually a much more unintuitive but powerful line here is if we use the pinhole threading to access the Rashida in server three, or what we think could be the Rashida in server three, firstly, we can trash the Rashida in server three. That's nice. We get to do it for free because of the Chesva credits. But if we see the Rashida here, we know that this card in this remote server has to be the Equa. Because if we were tracking the whole hand, which again, take your note taking, the only other card that could be in this remote server is the Tranquility Home Grid. And you can't put two Tranquility Home Grids in the same server. So I think it's actually more important in some way that you could consider pinholing this Rashida, which would give you information on what this is. There is some chance that the corporation put the Tranquility here and the Rashida in here. And if that's the case, like power to them, that means that the Equa is in hand and that's not going to be great for them over the next couple of turns. So there's a small chance you could go for the Rashida and just hope that that means that's the Equa. The Axe is the Equa here, so we know it's the Equa. At the end of the day, if we can't get to this remote server, it's actually kind of important we trash the Rashida. We don't necessarily lose, but it's a really interesting board state. And I think what you pinhole here is actually quite exciting. So we know it's the Equa here. We have all our breakers. We have 15 credits. We can have 19 credits when we play the Sure Gamble. Can we run the remote server? We need to make sure we get in it with a click and two credits. We don't know what this outermost dice is. I don't know what we expect to break. There's some pretty expensive breaks sometimes. It could be like a big old, uh, uh, what's it? A gatekeeper could cost us a lot. And then there's a bunch of defensive upgrades. We actually should know what a couple of these defensive upgrades are. We're pretty sure that this one's a Tukana that was reinstalled. In fact, we do know it's a Tukana because we've seen all of HQ. And then we know that this one on the innermost is a ganked. So at the end of the day, that means there's two face down cards that we have to play around. We're going to assume one of them is a Mana Garn Skunk Works, which means it only makes sense to get in here if we have either two clicks left or five credits on top of the Equa attacks. And Chill plays this great, drops a Sure Gamble, gets to 19, and runs the remote server. This is the first time I think we run with a click and two credits left. And of course we do. We saw the Equa there, so this is fantastic. And now we get to see what this outermost ice is. Another really big thing about having a click and credits left here is that if an ice is rest here that we feel like we can't break this ice and get through all of the server and still deal with Mana Garm and with Ikua, we can just run the Rashida and know that we'll probably have another turn this turn to play out. We won't lose next turn if we trash the Rashida. So again, having a click left here is good for the obvious reason, but it's also good in another reason, which is like we can deal with the Rashida. Now the corporation here reses Vovo. Vovo will make the ice res here, the on sale only four credits. And also later when we res the Managarm, we save two more credits. So this Vovo saves the corporation three credits. I'd argue on this exact board state, resing the Vovo is in some ways not worth the three credits. Um, I'm not sure if the money calculation matters that much, but the big thing here is now as the runner, if you've been doing all your note taking, you've done all your tracking, you know the server is ganked. Tranquility, obviously, Vovo, obviously, Tucana, obviously, the agenda, obviously, and then there's only one defensive upgrade we have to play around. It's very likely that defensive upgrade is the Manic Arm Skunk Works, which is either, again, two clicks or five credits. Uh, that's this card here that we've trashed another copy of. So now we should have full information of whether we can get into this remote server, still pay five credits, and then still play a uh, click and two credits to steal the Iqua. And we have the math here. 
On sell, mind you, is five to break fully. So we're going to. Drafter is four, that costs us nine. Magnet is three, that costs us 12. And it leaves us with seven credits, which is credit perfect. And if we weren't credit perfect here, if we we're expecting there to be a mana garm and we know it's an Iqua, we should just break as much of the on sell that matters and then just run and trash the Rashida and say, I'll be back next turn. And I think that's kind of fine for us. If that doesn't work out, we can always just hail Mary R&D. But here we have the full information because we've seen just about everything and there's only one unknown card and it's the mana garm. We go through with seven credits. The mana garm is res. We pay five. It leaves us with a click and two credits for the first time this whole game. And we credit perfect, click perfect, steal the Iqua and win the game. That's a good ending. Well played to both players there to get there. I think there's a nice banter and chat about, yo, credit perfect, well done. I don't think Chill noticed, but thanks to both players. Now, this is a totally wild game, and I'm really excited to show this off because there's a lot to learn in this matchup. I think this sort of deck allows you to focus on that sort of where is the agenda. And this basic idea of like, you know, taking notes gives us so information. We should have known what all these cards are. We should have known what R&D is. We know what all of HQ is. Note taking is so important in this game. Please start note taking. But the basic idea that if we're gonna run, run sooner in the turn than later is so powerful. Obviously cards like Ikoa Project are a very good example and this thing was really annoying for us because we did not respect it until the final turn where it really did matter. Uh, we could have won the game a couple turns ago. We could have won the game the turn before if we ran R&D. The Spin Doctor would have made it a bit interesting. But this shows you again, this fundamentals game of answering the question of where are the agendas forces you to play this deck cleanly so you know where to use your multi-axis. Putting yourself in the corpse shoes, dividing by five, all these are super powerful tools that you can, at the start of every turn, just spend like a couple seconds looking at numbers and think, does the corp have an agenda? They've been drawing a lot, but they have a remote server and they didn't jam into it. So they probably are just looking for an agenda. And then whenever you see that, you know, hey, I should be running R&D. Man, I was so stoked when I received this uh, replay because I think it's a really good game to show off some of these fundamentals. How to play against HB, making sure that you're running, making sure you're forcing them to res their ice, but also making sure you're doing it early in the turn. We saw how important that is across this whole game. And then those three fundamental questions we're asking ourselves at the beginning of every turn. Where are the agendas? What's the game going to look like in a couple of turns? How do we win? How do we lose? How do we make sure those happen or don't happen? And then, of course, what's in the remote server? And when it comes to a deck like this, that's all about intelligently using your multi-axis, answering those questions like where are the agendas, the divide by five rule is so important. And it's something that a lot of players, I think, who are playing Netrunner at a beginner and intermediate level can spend a good period of time and just focus on that. And at the end of the day, if this video, if you got through all of this and a lot of this is overwhelming, like it's already hard to play Netrunner, what do you mean I have to answer all these questions? What I'd highly recommend is just take one topic you learned from this video and spend your next five or 10 games, whatever you're playing in person on JNet and just focus on those. Whether it's, I'm just gonna note take and do that well, that's fantastic. Whether I'm just gonna plan my turn and make sure that I'm drawing before I'm installing stuff, that's fantastic too. These sort of things, the more that you do them, the more that it becomes ingrained and eventually it'll just be a reflex and then we can go on and fold in another idea. So, you know, compartmentalizing it is super important. Make sure you're playing cleanly and make sure you're not, you know, uh, building in bad habits. All that sort of stuff is super important. But um, at the end of the day, finding out where the agenda is is such a fun puzzle and there is so much to clean from this game. We have a second one coming up in the near future. Chill sent a second replay. It's against an outfit deck. That's really fun. We're playing the same Zaya deck, so we can hopefully roll with the fundamentals we learned from this one. But if you found this interesting, if you have any questions, firstly, hit me up in the comments. Hopefully this made sense for just about any format. And if you like this sort of content, uh, liking the video, sharing it, subscribing to the channel, there's a lot of ways you can help the Metropol Grid grow. And I think that's mostly it. Again, thanks so much for watching. That's a long one. We have a lot to talk about, and hopefully this was useful. But otherwise, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks for watching. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I know replay reviews have been a pretty highly requested topic for us to tackle again on this channel. We did one uh, a couple of years ago now, and the response to that was incredibly positive. You can find the link to that. It will be at the end of this video, uh, but it's a card pool now that I think it's like two or three years old. Fundamentals still work, but maybe some different cards you're not used to. Uh, but we're really excited to be back to that again. Huge thank you to Chillstad. And if you have any feedback about the format, whether we're too granular, not granular enough, whether you the repetition gets to you or whether you like that, because I think repetition is really important when you're trying to instill some sort of fundamentals. Whatever it takes for you to get more out of this sort of content, please let me know. I'm all ears. And of course, I want to give a huge thank you to all these names here and more. These are just some of the folks that help support the Metropol Grid on Patreon. And at this point, we've now been on Patreon for just about a year. And all the support from the community that allows me to put the time and effort into all the live streams and all the video content, all the stuff that I'm excited to get out for Netrunner, it's literally been life changing. I hope that's obvious here. So thank you so much to all the folks, all the Daily Cast patrons. Their names are not here, but all the support is incredibly appreciated. 
If you're interested in more Netrunner education, by the way, we do teach Netrunner lessons 1v1. We've been doing them in the degree mail sessions and on an ad hoc basis. If you want to try it out, you can always hit me up at uh, metropolgrade at gmail.com. But otherwise, thanks so much again. And we'll have more replay reviews coming up in the near future. Hopefully you're excited for those. Thanks so much again for watching. Take care. Ciao.